Hi, we welcome everybody. Let me try that with the speaker or the microphone. We welcome everybody to this meeting of the Sequoia Union High School District Board of Trustees. And I do see that uh, we still have zero attendees. We have our panelists here. Uh, this is an opportunity for members of the public to provide public comment on items on the closed session agenda for today. Uh, we will be uh, going to closed session from five o'clock to six o'clock and then returning to public session at six o'clock. Uh, we do not see any members of the public here in the boardroom, and we do not see any members of the public as attendees at this point. Um, so having no public comments offered, we will adjourn this uh, open session to closed session and return at six o'clock. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Excuse me, let me uh, mute my computer. Huh? All right, now I don't get an echo. That's good. All right, welcome to this uh, meeting of the Sequoia Union High School District Board of Trustees. Uh, before anything else, I would like to um, ask uh, Ms. Gonzalez to make a statement about translation. Hola, para cualquier persona que necesita la traducción de esta reunión, use el botón en la parte inferior que diga interpretation. And uh, uh, to our superintendent, would you uh, please do us the honor of introducing Ms. Gonzalez to our community? Good evening, everyone. Uh, we'd like to welcome Gabriela Gonzalez. Uh, she has joined as our senior uh, administrator in the office of the superintendent. We are proud to have her here as additional support. And so we welcome her and we just give her a Sequoia Union High School District friendly welcome and congratulations. Thank you. Please stand, Ms. Gonzalez. Please stand if we recognize. You come to the camera so people can see. I mean, they can't, they're unable to see you. You would like to say something where you're from and if you. Okay, uh, and uh, we are continuing uh, with our return to uh, new normal operations with um, members of the public here in attendance and members of the public in attendance via Zoom. Uh, for those present here, those wishing to make public comment, please fill in one of the speaker cards. Uh, and present them to Ms. Loesia. They will make their way up to me. Um, and for those in our Zoom audience wishing to speak, please um, raise your Zoom hands when we get to the agenda item on which you wish to on which you wish to speak. Uh, for uh, those wishing to speak on agenda uh, on items that are not on the agenda, those. Uh, comments are to be made during uh, agenda item 11.1 .1, public comment. Uh, we will normally allocate uh, three minutes for each speaker uh, and no more than 10 minutes for any given topic. Uh, if we have a larger number of speakers than can fit in that time, uh, we will adjust the time and announce it before uh, anyone begins speaking. Uh, to cut it to two minutes or 90 seconds or one minute in order to accommodate all of those who do wish to speak. Uh, and if the board uh, agrees when there's a large uh, number of speakers, we uh, can also extend the overall 10 minute limit for a given item. But that is what we are trying to uh, keep our time organized around.
Um, and as a reminder, the board will not act upon any matter that has not been agendized except under limited circumstances as permitted by law. Uh, it is the policy of the board to refer matters raised in this forum to staff for investigation and or action where appropriate. Okay, with that, can we move along and have our roll call? Student Trustee Stead. Here. Student Trustee Osuna. Oh, trustee, Student Trustee Osuna is on babysitting duty tonight. So he sends his regrets, but he'll be here next time. Uh, trustee Thompson. Here. Trustee Stevenson. Here. Trustee here. Ginn. Here. Vice President Dubois. Here. President Sarver. Here. A quorum is present. Thank you. Uh, that moves us along to approval of the agenda. Um, I would like to make one uh, recommendation or actually two related recommendations for uh, smoothing it out. Um, I would like to have our um, set of uh, presentations, hearings and action around um, sun shining of bargaining proposals uh, together. So in order to achieve that, I would recommend that we drop item 12.1, the presentation of the American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees um, uh, initial, initial bargaining proposal to the bottom of the information item. So move 12.1 after 12.3, that would put it immediately before the public hearing for the district's proposal. And then I would uh, further um, suggest that we move our action, our single action item um, to approve um, the district's initial bargaining proposal uh, ahead of the discussion items. So the result would be we would go 12.2, um, 12.3, then 12.1. 13.1, 15.1, and into the discussion items. Um, and um, I put that to uh, uh, whether there is any um, concern about that or um, Mr. Not, accept a motion. Mr. President, for... as long as you keep track of the order for us, I'd be happy to move <laughs> approval of the agenda as modified. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor? Um, Aye. Okay, the modified agenda is approved and it's on me to remember all that stuff. Okay. Uh, report out in close on closed session. Um, the board uh, took action on three items uh, by a vote of five. Uh, board members in favor, zero against. The Board of Trustees approved the settlement agreement for case number 2021-2022-04. By um, a vote of five board members in favor, zero against. The Board of Trustees approved the settlement agreement for case number 2020-2021-6. And also by um, a unanimous vote, uh, the um, board voted to approve the final settlement agreement. Okay. That brings us to our approval of the consent agenda. The board action is uh, to approve the following items it is taken simultaneously with one motion, which is not debatable and requires a unanimous roll call for vote for passage. The action indicated on each item is deemed to have been considered in full and action taken as worded therein. Only members of the board and the superintendent may remove items from the consent agenda. Members of the public may provide comments at the start of the consent agenda item, which may convince a board member or the superintendent to remove an item for further discussion. Um, the board, uh, the motion would be to waive the reading of the consent agenda, accept the reports, adopt the resolutions and approve other items. Um, I do not um, see any cards yet um, for, for that. I do see one 
attendee hand up. Um, and it is uh, Karen Van Putten. Is that um, a request re re um, regarding the consent agenda? If so, uh, please unmute and uh, go ahead and speak. Oh, the hand has gone down. Um, so I, uh, I will assume that that uh, was actually uh, advanced warm up for public comment. Okay. Um, all right, so with that, uh, having not heard any comment about the consent agenda, um, we will accept a uh, motion for approval. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, can we have a roll call for that, please? Student Trustee Stead? Yes. Trustee Thompson? Yes. Trustee Stevenson? Yes. Yeah. Trustee Ginn? Yes. Yeah. Vice President Dubois? Yes. President Sarver? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. All right, that moves us along to special recognitions. Superintendent Williams. Thank you again. Good evening. This is always the most important part of our um, board meeting, and that is we have an opportunity to recognize the excellence uh, within our district. I am going to ask that uh, Dr. Elizabeth Chacon, Assistant Superintendent of Student Services, come forth for this recognition. I have the honor of presenting recognitions tonight from Sequoia High School. The first is for Stacy Starr, Sequoia Food Services Lead. In overseeing the implementation of Sequoia's lunch service this year, Stacy Starr's leadership has been vital in ensuring that hungry students are fed efficiently and thoroughly each day. The lines have been long, but they move fast and as always end with a friendly smile from the service staff. This happy adult face models for students how much their individual success matters to our community, whether in the classroom or in the cafeteria. What might seem like a small gesture has the huge impact of allowing students to focus on learning. Stacy's team gets it. The Sequoia community is appreciative of her leadership. Thank you, Stacy. And the next recognition goes to their ethnic studies team. Consistently over the past three months, if you talk to ninth graders or their parents at Sequoia, the likelihood is high that you will hear how much they are enjoying their ethnic studies class. Zi Nguyen, Carlos Navarrete, Diana Nguyen, Michelle Payton, Melissa Perez, and Pablo Aguilera have been instrumental in preparing course objectives, materials, and assessments. It is, however, the way in which they've structured and facilitated learning that has been a source of inspiration to the entire community. They have made sensitive topics relevant and engaging, recognizing the difference between being uncomfortable and unsafe by centering student voices and empowering learners. The work they're doing with ninth graders this year will continue to enrich learning across the curriculum moving forward. Hats off to the Sequoia Ethnic Studies team. Thank you. And we look forward to personally delivering their certificates of appreciation. Um, before the holiday. So once again, thank you. And we also thank each and every one of you for your service to our community and to our students. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. And thank you to all of those we have recognized. This brings us to item nine, student trustee comments. Okay, there we go. 
Thank you so much, President Sarver. I start my comments this week with an update on the Student Advisory Committee. We met last Tuesday and had a great meeting discussing what we want our action items to be for the rest of the year. As always, I'm continued to be blown away by how much our students care about bettering this district. Uh, and other news at uh, all of our many site, uh, many student le leaders at all sites have reached out to me to talk about the situations of bathrooms on campus. Many bathrooms remain locked throughout the day. At times, there will only be one or two open available bathrooms for students to use. This is both inconvenient and uncomfortable for our students. These bathroom closures uh, seem at times unnecessary and also bathrooms are often closed during lunch and brunch, meaning there's very few times for students to use the bathroom. Finally, I would like to use this opportunity to once again ask for mandatory consent education to prevent sexual harassment and assault at our schools. In order to combat these issues, we have to be proactive and best address these issues with comprehensive consent education. Thank you. Okay. Duly noted input. I see the superintendent furiously making notes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, we move on to comments uh, from the Sequoia District Teachers Association. Hello. Um, I wanted to start my comments by welcoming Dr. Chacon to the meeting. It was very exciting to get to meet her, and um, she very graciously made time for me in her first week on the job to chat and catch up on uh, some of our issues, and I know she's made time for a number of our members as well, and we really are looking forward to keeping that open door policy open and um, working with her to address student services. Um, I want to thank the board for the action you just took on item 7.5 to raise the substitute pay rate. We are hopeful. We are hopeful that's going to help us address um, some of the coverage shortages we've had, especially um, we are appreciative of the rate, the higher rate for uh, district retirees recognizing the sort of value add they bring and to our communities. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity it gives me to sit down with uh, um, Ms. Leach to talk about ways we can avoid any unintended consequences of payroll issues that are tied to the sub rate. Um, in the area of student services, uh, the panorama survey went out to get sort of a, a baseline. And I know it's being, um, uh, rolled out to students over the next week or so, maybe two weeks. And I took it myself this morning. And um, it was interesting to me how differently many of the questions landed this year than in previous years when I've taken the same survey. And so I'm hoping when we look at the results, both the staff results and the student results, we're gonna be able to have conversations that will put those results in context. I worry greatly as I answered questions about the support that my site gives to me, that I, my answers were lower across the board, but that's not because my site is providing me with less. It's simply because I need more this year and they don't have any more to give me. And so I worry that when we have things that we can compare year on year, if those scores go down, it looks like a negative to those people. And so if I'm worried that my principal is gonna be in a negative light, I also worry that my members will be seen in a negative light if the student results follow that same pattern. And I know it's not the intention of anyone because we all know that we're just in a, an area of much greater need this year. Um, update on bargaining. We have since our last, I'm trying to remember when the last board meeting was, but we've had um, a half day of bargaining that we had earlier this month and we will go back to the table on the 22nd. 
because we've had some stumbling blocks in scheduling, we um, are trying to schedule at least one more day, potentially a half day, maybe a day and a half. Um, the scheduling is very difficult at this point because everybody's availability is tight and teachers do not want to take time off before finals or when they're giving students finals because our first priority is to the students in our classes. But we are hopeful we're gonna be able to come up with those dates because we really think it's important to move as quickly as we can um, in bargaining to be able to deliver an agreement to the community and to our members who are working, you know, harder, it, as hard, if not harder than they ever have before. Thank you. Okay, and now we would like to hear from uh, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. We have a representative here tonight. Okay. All right. I'm not seeing a hand go up um, for that among our attendees either. All right, so we will move on um, to public comment. All right. And we now have five cards. All right, so uh, to keep those five within our 10 minutes, uh, I would suggest we set uh, a limit of two minutes apiece, unless it is the board's preference that we uh, extend the time um, to 15 minutes for public comment this evening. I don't mind 15 minutes. I don't either. It relieves some guilt I'd have about telling one of the participants earlier that she would have three minutes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So if everybody is planned for their three minutes, let us go ahead and do that. So um, our first public comment will come from uh, Susan Moore and our second from Abby Corman. So it's great to see all of you again. Um, it was wonderful for many of you to be able to attend the MA homecoming game. And um, you had our, our community sincerely appreciated it. It was, it was a very nice gesture on your part. And it gave you the opportunity to see exactly um, how much our stadium needs improvements and renovations. If you'll remember the sound system that you couldn't hear anything. And overall, the stadium is in badly is in great need of repair. So not only is MA Stadium the smallest in the district, although we have the largest enrollment, the stands were built in the 50s. And those with disabilities, as you noticed, are forced to sit in stands to that are not part of the stadium, of the regular stadium. And this is truly not the inclusiveness that I know that our district is all about. Additional safety ex uh, issues also exist with the overcrowding and uh, many people who just want to come and enjoy this part of our community event are forced to stand during the entire game. In addition to the stadium, we need to address the needs of our student body with a student success center. That would include uh, space for our academic program, um, potentially space for uh, PE, and we also do not have a locker room for our freshmen, and it would potentially include that as well. This project aligns perfectly with the Sequoia Union High School District goals that were laid out on July 31st, especially numbers one, two, and three that include a focus on, on strengthening instruction by improving attendance, achieving equity through systems, policies, and procedures, and ensuring the well being of students through the implementation of a multi tiered system of supports. As we discussed, Dr. Williams, achieving the 2.0 minimum GPA that's required for students to participate in athletics is a major struggle for many, many of our students. The motivation that being on the field provides is well beyond anything else that we can offer. We have a large group of alumni, community members, and current families, as well as the MA administration, 
who would like to see our school board invest in a project to improve our stadium and provide a safe, inclusive place that brings together our community in a way that nothing else quite does. We also need to continue to focus on our students' well being and connection to our school and education and achieving the goals of the district. We've met with a firm who has previously worked with the district um, on different projects and have looked into what, again, could potentially be possible. And we're very, very excited by this. What we need now is your support to move this project forward. Thank you so much. Okay, um, Abby Corman and Jennifer Lang will be next. Hi, good evening. My name is Abby Corman. I'm a teacher at Menlo Atherton. I've been present at a lot of the board meetings through Zoom, so I'm glad to be here in person with you all tonight. I'd like to first commend the district on the passing of the equity resolution, the thoughtful town hall the superintendent set up, and the revision of the EL master plan that have all happened in the past few weeks. All of these actions show the beginning steps toward changing policy so that we're not just a district that talks about serving all students, but one that actively changes policy to better serve the students who need it most. With this in mind, my public comment today is about the immediate and urgent need to support our most underserved students whose behavior and academic outcomes are showing us they need more from us right now. While I appreciated the ESSER funding presentation last board meeting, including the $3 million being used to implement strategies for continuous and safe in-person learning, I'm concerned about how much of that money will be spent on immediate student-facing services and how much will go toward district positions. My questions today are in regards to the ESSER funding presented at the last board meeting, as well as any other funding and plans that may be available to support students immediately. My concerns echo Ms. Susie Cho's public comments from a board meeting or two ago, where she advocated on behalf of the district using its money for more student facing positions. It also echoes Trustee Stid and Asuna's presentation around the needs of students on campus right now. I'm pleased to hear we've hired another behavior analyst, as I know Kendra at the district has been swamped with double or maybe even triple the caseload an analyst is meant to have. I was thrilled to find out that it means that my school site with almost 100 suspensions so far this year will be able to have her on campus three days a week. I'm wondering why that third analyst position is not yet posted on EdJoin, nor are the two additional school psychologists we approved, nor the mental health counselor. I'm also wondering if any of these positions will be student facing or if these positions will be district positions as well. For the newly approved one mental health counselor from ESSER funds, I'm wondering how the site will be chosen for this person, if they will roam, or if this too is a district position. While it's important to have experienced, knowledgeable staff making decisions at the district, our students are in desperate need of mental health support right now. Our mental health specialists at our sites are overwhelmed and it's not clear what's being done in, in the immediate to support our students. Even this funding feels as though it's meant to help serve students down the line after teachers have received training and the district has devised plans, which is important, but does not address the dire needs of our students right now. We're a few months back into school after a traumatic once in a lifetime event, and our structures feel the same as they were pre pandemic, despite our clear naming that our students need more. What new structures, positions or plans are we implementing right now that directly support our student mental and behavioral health. Thank you. Next will be Jennifer Lang, followed by Carol Ann Coleman. Good evening, my name is Jennifer Lang and I'm a teacher at Woodside High School. Tonight I come to this podium to stand in solidarity for two items that are close to my heart. One, the lack of progress made on negotiation, negotiating a new contract for SDTA and for the people who are under attack after the presentation of the equity resolution adopted in October of 2021 by this school board. First, I stand in solidarity with the teachers union who is fighting hard to maintain stability with an educational world that has turned upside down since COVID-19. Being an educational professional during this time in the pandemic is extremely difficult 
because of the uncertainty that teachers face as a daily, on a daily basis of battling invisible germs that could harm us or take our lives. What makes this experience even more stressful is knowing that we are working without a contract. Please offer some stability to our lives and return to the bargaining table so that we can start to negotiate the contract and begin a new chapter in the life of Sequoia Union High School District. Second, I wish to stand in solidarity and want to go on record that I fully support the district's pursuit of equity and justice in education, which was demonstrated by the adoption of the equity resolution during the, June, the October 21st, actually, excuse me, October 20, 2021 board meeting. I wanna show my support for the work that Dr. Williams has done in this brief amount of time serving on, as our superintendent and the heavy lifting that the equity task force has done to bring about change within this district. I'm concerned about a small group or number of stakeholders who are personally attacking those who are doing the equity work in the district. And I will not stand by and allow people that I deeply respect to be threatened or verbally abused. The equity work is pivotal in ensuring that all students are treated equally and have every opportunity to become the best people possible. It is also my hope that the staff members are allowed to continue this work without fear of retaliation. The time is now for change to ensure staff and student success in the future for Sequoia Union High School District. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Carol Ann Coleman and um, John DeFerris de Gomez. Okay, thank you. Okay, can y'all hear me? Mm -hmm. It is so nice to see everyone in person. Uh, my name is Carol Ann Coleman. My intention is to give a letter of love. Um, as an education specialist at Sequoia High School, also a parent, a mom, a wife, an EDC member, a facilitator of the Affinity Fellowship, and an ally co-conspirator committed to dismantling racism. I completely support Dr. Williams and her collaborative work fully supporting the vision and commitment to Resolution 1699. Committing to equity, inclusion, and diversity. This needs to be ongoing in everything we do. I'm proud to work for a school district that has earned a B plus so far on equity work, but I think that the school district can do better. I believe that the school district can potentially lead the Bay Area in diversity, intersectionality, and accountability. Committing to equitable opportunities is not a fad. I would love to see more of our BIPOC colleagues and staff members be encouraged to take more leadership jobs at every school site. I have been under the leadership of Morgan Man Marchbanks, Bonnie Hansen, and Sean Priest. and wanna to continue to do the equitable work so that all students have access and that we care for the whole person. Instead of rigor, can I encourage respect and regard for the dependent learner? Instead of referring to students as at risk, can we find a different word that honors the students that struggle instead of labeling them as dangerous or in danger of dropping out? I agree that racism and discrimination have no place anywhere, and especially in Sequoia Union High School District and the Board of Trustees expectations of the highest standards of equity, opportunity and fair treatment fair treatment is upheld. I personally care about this ongoing commitment because every child deserves to feel safe, cared for, and loved. Every child deserves to be heard, to be seen, and supported regardless of economic status, ethnicity, race, sexual orientation, and abilities. I will continue to support all students so that everyone has access and is treated equitably in all systems and structures. And I acknowledge that I can always do better every day, always, in all ways. Thank you again, Dr. Williams, Board of Trustees, Cabinet Members, Glenda Ortiz-Galan, Tasha Henderson, Pablo Aguilara, 
you pave a way for more to do better. Thank you. Thank you. And our final card, uh, is it John Dare or Hannah? John Dare. John so thank you, um, President Sarver and, and members of the board. Um, I really had no intentions of speaking publicly tonight. I'm here to support the SDTA. But after hearing the comments of our student trustee, I felt the need to step in um, because it's a trend that I'm seeing at my school and I'm rather horrified to hear that it's happening at all of our school sites apparently. The restriction of student restrooms has an impact far beyond just the convenience. And I wanna give you an idea of how it's affecting the students and how it's also affecting the classroom. So I am primarily teaching newcomer ELs this year. That's 80% of my, my teaching load. And um, we have struggled all year, but especially since the reduction of access to student bathrooms, because my students, as I hear on a daily basis with no exaggeration, are having to choose at brunch time and at lunch time between eating or going to the restroom. If they are in line for food, they don't have time to go to the restroom. And if they take time to go to the restroom, they don't have time to make it through the food line. That is unacceptable. The other thing that's also happening is that um, the impact on the classroom. When children can't go to the restroom in passing periods and in breaks and lunches, then that falls to the classroom time. I have spent, I've never had such an on, onslaught of petitions every single class period by so many students needing to go to the restroom. And, you know, I know this is an unintended consequence. I'm not certain what the, the philosophy is behind the closure of the student bathrooms. I'm aware of our TikTok impact recently and, and other things, but there has to be another way because it is interrupting class. I feel like sometimes I'm a kindergarten teacher, not a high school teacher because of having to help my students manage their personal necessities during class time. And like I said, every day having comments from at least one or two students about not being able to go to the restroom or they skipped brunch because they needed to go to the restroom. So I ask you to please consider finding another way to deal with whatever issue it is that may have us closing all bathrooms but one, because these are impacts beyond convenience. These are impacts on learning and impacts on some of our most vulnerable student populations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we do have one hand up among our attendees, uh, Ms. Downing. Sorry, I was on mute. How do I make myself visible? Can someone like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm off on medical leave, so I have not been connected to a computer. If someone can make it so that I'm visible. You, you, you will only be on audio. Yeah. Oh, there's no visual. Okay. Oh, there you are. Excuse me. You have been added as uh, a participant and you're visible. Okay. You can see me. Okay. I can't see you, but hi. <laughs> um, good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent, Dr. Denise Williams. Sequoia District Teacher Association President, Edith Salvatore, parents, all the students in the Sequoia Union High School District. Um, and if any of my students are logged in, I hope that you're doing well um, this semester. I, I miss you. Um, my name is Charlotte Downing, I'm 16th year school counselor at Woodside High School. Um, I'm currently on a medical leave of absence due to the inability to manage the high level of stress caused by the demands placed on school counselors in the district before the pandemic and now. Counselor case low size has been an ongoing concern. For many years, I've advocated for school counselors to have equitable student to counselor caseloads across the district. But during contract negotiations, the district has always stood in the way of this request and claimed to not have funds to add school counselors to the budget. Unfortunately, parents and individual school foundations at different sites realized the importance of additional school counselors and decided to privately fund the positions across the district. Parents, 
in the Sequoia Union High School District see the benefit of having an accessible counselor. We are a public school district. Parents shouldn't have to privately fund district positions when the district has the revenue to cover. The district should fund counselor positions so that students at each site can have an equitable experience with their school counselor based on same allocation of students per counselor across the district. Currently, each school site has a different am amount of students per counselor, which directly affects each student's high school experience. As previously stated, I'm currently out on medical leave to manage um, my anxiety, depression, and ADHD. The pandemic took its toll on my mental health too. I hope that this message will encourage you to consider taking care of the mental health of the professionals that take care of all the students in the Sequoia Union High School District. It's time to negotiate. Although I may never be able to return to my position as a school counselor to experience the lower case low sizes. Creating equity for students and counselors across the district is the right thing to do. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Okay, those are uh, all the cards and speakers that we had. And we are um, ready now to move on to our information items. And so we'll uh, begin with 12.2, the Sequoia Adult School presentation. So thank you everybody for uh, inviting us and allowing us to present uh, Sequoia Adult Schools information in preparation for the small school study session that's going to be happening on December 8th. So I just wanted to present to the board a lot of information about uh, Sequoia Adult School because I know that we have some new board members, some new cabinet members as well too that might not have a lot of visibility about, about what's happening at the Sequoia Adult School. So I just wanted to go ahead and present some information regarding the school. So. Uh, first, I wanted to give an overview just to give some information about the school, and then I wanted to get into a little bit about some milestones that we've had for the past couple of years, as well as uh, talk about some program expansion intentions and some growth opportunities that we're looking forward to as well. So uh, I have some items here to sort of review uh, in regards to the overview of our adult school, including the mission, uh, some basic school information that I think would be extremely relevant to understand. Uh, some school data, including some demographics and enrollments, uh, some of our major programs, and, and, and some survey data that we've collected as well. Too. So uh, one of the big things about Sequoia Old School, which I, I think it's really important to recognize the difference between uh, a lot of perceptions of what adult education is. You know, a lot, of a lot of the times I think people view adult ed as sort of like, you know, senior classes for community enrichment, which it is oftentimes, uh, or mainly ESL programs where, you know, people play sort of games and activities and things like that. Uh, it very, it, it really sort of is determined by the population of the students. So in regards to Sequoia Old School, our mission is to help students transition to careers, community colleges, post-secondary education, as well as help students integrate within the community as well. So. so some really important things about Sequoia Old School that I think are, things to take into, into consideration would be, first, we are completely funded outside of the districts, uh, mainly through state and federal funding. Uh, so we do have, uh, through the state, the California Adult Education Program, and through federal funding, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act grants. Uh, the primary source of funding comes through the San Mateo County Consortium of Adult Schools and Community Colleges. Within this organization, uh, we work to sort of negotiate uh, the allotment of, of, of the funds for the different adult schools and community colleges as well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, our primary programs include the high school equivalency program, the high school diploma program, English as a second language and computer training programs. Uh, our morning classes are from nine to 12 and our evening classes are from 6.30 to 
A very important point that's also related to our federal funding that we receive is that our classes are all free. And that is a requirement of the funding that we receive as well. Uh, in addition, our school has a little bit over 30 staff. Uh, we have 10 classified staff and a little bit over 20 certificated staff. Uh, another thing to note would be our certificated staff are on uh, the Sequoia Adult School Federation of Teachers Union Agreement. Uh, it's different from SDTA. Uh, the implications of that would be uh, all of our teachers are hourly employees, uh, non-benefited. So even if you work 40 hours per week, you also do not receive benefits through that. Uh, some information about our demographics. Uh, so looking at student age, uh, you can see that a large portion of our students are between the ages of 18 to 29. Uh, furthermore, we can see students ranging from 30 to 49 uh, represent a large portion of our students as well too. If we're looking at the population of students that are 50 and up, uh, that represents about, what is that, like 9%, almost 10% of students. In years of education, we can see that we have a lot of students that have less than a high school degree, uh, a fair portion of students that have uh, less than eight years of education as well too. Furthermore, uh, we have a very large uh, population of Hispanic uh, or Latino students. 85% uh, of our students identify themselves as English language learners. And on average, our students earn a monthly income of about $2,200. So for enrollments, our school generally enrolls about 1,200 students per year. Uh, as you can see from the numbers here, uh, the pandemic had a pretty significant impact on our enrollment numbers. Uh, so 2019, 2020, in the last quarter of that school year, that was the, when the pandemic hit, we were actually on a sort of trajectory, trajectory to be able to have one of the highest enrollment numbers in recent history. Um, but because of the pandemic, you know, we didn't hit that mark. And as you can see, our ESL program, which uh, we have a lot of students that have limited access to technology, and other essential resources to access education were very severely impacted by the pandemic. So just a little bit of information about some of our major programs as well too. Uh, the high school equivalency program is one of our biggest programs or bigger programs. Uh, this class prepares students to pass the high set or GED. We are also an authorized test center for the high set and GED. So when students are ready to take the tests, they're able to take the test at our site. All of these classes are with direct instruction with credentialed teachers. And we use Canvas in all of our classes, very much just like all the high school sites. Our high school diploma pro program is an independent study model where students are able to get their uh, courses through Edgenuity. Uh, there is a teacher available to assist students with, their, uh, with help on their assignments as well. So uh, another important thing to note is that 97% of our students in these programs are students that came from Sequoia Union High School District high school sites. Um, the majority of the students may be within the past zero to five years of attending one of the high school sites, but occasionally we might have a student that might have attended a high school site within the past 15 or 20 years. In terms of graduates in both of these programs, um, this is actually a pretty interesting number over here. So uh, at our best, we get close to 80 graduates per year. Um, during the pandemic, graduation rates significantly decreased, especially for high school equivalency graduates. Uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, we had to close the test centers for high set and GD, and that was pretty much across the whole state. So we had a limited amount of graduates. But in the middle of the pandemic, we actually had a significant increase in high school diploma graduates. And this really was because of the 130 uh, credit graduation requirement that actually really made a significant boost for our students and helped to get a lot of our students graduated and progressing in their careers and further training as well too. So the biggest program at Sequoia Adult School would be the English as a Second Language program. Uh, we offer five uh, levels of ESL. We also serve some district minors uh, enrolled in our sites upon referral from the district. Uh, we have had a long standing partnership with Kenyatta College to help students transition to community colleges. Uh, about every year, we transition about 150 students uh, to community colleges, with the majority of the students going to Kenyatta College. 
Students in higher levels are also co-enrolled in computer training courses, which is a sort of new thing that we started recently. Uh, just like all the high school equivalency programs, we use Canvas across all levels, similar to all the high school sites as well. So we don't necessarily have graduations within ESL, but uh, we do have uh, level gains. And this is uh, one of the requirements of the federal grant that helps keep our uh, programs running. Uh, with that, we can look and see that uh, annually we have on average uh, slightly higher than 60% level gains, which is my understanding slightly above uh, state standards of level gains for the adult schools across California. Uh, we can see that the level gains decreased slightly during the pandemic. Uh, again, we had to close the school. We weren't able to test a lot of students. And also, um, they didn't actually decrease that much just because uh, we were actually able to transition to online learning, completely synchronous online learning through Zoom and Canvas uh, within a couple of weeks of uh, our school closing. So it didn't actually have too much of an impact on the learning gains. I did mention before that we have district referrals for minors that come into our school. Um, so from 2018, 2019, we had around the mid thirties of uh, district minors that were referred to our program. The year after that, we had 60. Uh, we potentially could have had more uh, because, uh, because of the pandemic, our school got shut down. So there weren't any more uh, minors that were being referred. In the midst of the pandemic, uh, the numbers went down significantly. So also with uh, some of the feedback that we've given, uh, that we've received from the students, uh, we do quarterly surveys with our students to get information on how to improve our programs, uh, looking for areas of growth for our school. Uh, the first thing that we usually try to survey with our students is to make sure that our mission is in alignment with our student needs. So as we can see from this data over here, uh, the majority of students are attending our classes because they feel that our classes will help them further uh, their skills in gaining uh, better employment and advancing in their careers as well too. Uh, also a fair amount of students also see our school as helping them further at their education, whether through community college or job training. And then there's a significant amount of students that uh, see our schools helping them assist their children in their school and also contribute to their communities as well. So the bottom two responses over here, I chose these because I thought these were significant uh, changes in our school or significant uh, barriers for our students. So when I first came into Sequoia Old School in 2015, uh, this was before I became an administrator and I was a teacher on special assignment. Uh, there was very limited access to technology. The Wi-Fi couldn't support more than like 10 devices being connected at the same time. Uh, so I really helped to sort of push for a lot of educational technology to be implemented in a lot of the classrooms. We were able to upgrade the infrastructure, we integrated Canvas into all the curriculum, we have Chromebook carts in all the rooms now, uh, we're using ed tech in pretty much every class. So there was a significant increase in uh, engagement with computers and this sort of shows in the survey results from 2016 to 2018. Uh, so one of the major issues for our students is parking. And this is consistently the area that is rated the lowest by our students. Every single year, this, this survey is analyzed every year. Um, so we do not have a dedicated parking lot for our students. Our students are required to park in the community, the surrounding community. Um, you know, I've, I've heard anecdotally from students that they circle around the community for 20 minutes, can't find parking, and then they go home. They miss class because of that. We also get other information about career interests for our students as well too. This is a, a countywide um, initiative by all the adult schools. Uh, so the majority of our students uh, have a high interest in health careers. In addition to that, uh, computer certification and computer training programs as well. Small business ownership is also very important for our students as well as business finance and construction trades. Because of this feedback, we have integrated computer training classes into our, into our curriculum. Uh, we just recently established a partnership with Kenyatta College where students that complete computer training programs at our school are able to earn college credit for some Kenyatta College uh, computer classes as well. So 
Uh, prior to the pandemic, we had partnered with the Renaissance in East Palo Alto to offer free small business ownership classes at our site in both Spanish and English as well. So this was another separate survey that we also administer annually as well too. And this was done in collaboration with the Stanford Policy uh, Immigrant Lab as well too. And so this was a survey to help identify different barriers that our students faced uh, to their education. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there's a lot of uh, significant barriers that our students face. We do this annually. So I have a strong suspicion that maybe within a year, this might look different because this was administered in the middle of the pandemic. But we can see that housing assistance is something that's a significant need for our students. If you look at the red, the red is uh, what students want to receive versus that sort of teal color, which is what uh, services the students actually received. And there's a huge gap there. Uh, food assistance is up there, immigration assistance is up there, legal assistance. So to sort of help with these, we've established partnerships to help students overcome these barriers. Uh, we've had International Institute of the Bay Area visit our site to help students with immigration and legal assistance. Uh, since the pandemic started, we've partnered with Vegan Outreach to provide monthly uh, free food distributions to our students. Um, and uh, for uh, relationship assistance, we've uh, partnered with Cora to be able to provide referrals for students that are experiencing issues such as uh, domestic uh, abuse. Uh, so with that being said, uh, I think there's been some actually pretty significant milestones within the past couple of years for our school. Uh, in 2020, uh, we had a WASC midterm, which confirmed our original six year, uh, which uh, didn't require a visit. And I think partially just because it was in the middle of the pandemic, but you know, I think we were doing pretty well according to the feedback. Uh, we made some pretty significant uh, milestones with our support services. Uh, one thing that I'm particularly proud of and uh, with the support of our new administrator, Cindy Dominguez, and also one of our teachers, Judith Jones, we are now going to be a COVID vaccination site on December 2nd. And this will be our first time doing this. Uh, we're doing a pretty good outreach for the community to be able to help with this. Uh, we've expanded our support services network to be able to help students overcome educational barriers. We set up an infrastructure for support services within our county's consortium as well too. Uh, the majority of that team is uh, members of our school within the county as well. So uh, we are in the process of creating a toiletry, a toiletries and dry food pantry to be able to have uh, toiletries and dry food for our students that need it. And uh, it's, since the pandemic, we've had a teacher on special assignment that's been really, really great about expanding our volunteer tutoring program to be able to provide additional tutoring assistance for high school equivalency and high school diploma students, and also uh, instructional support in the ESL classrooms as well. Technology integration has been a pretty big point for us as well too. Um, I'm really proud to say that we were one of the first adult schools in the Bay Area to completely transition to fully asynchronous learning through uh, Zoom and Canvas. Uh, we use Canvas in all of our programs. It's especially important for us just because all of the California community colleges use Canvas, and this really helps with our transitions uh, to college for our students. In addition to that, um, we've been back in person since September. Our, our terms are a little bit different from the high school sites, but uh, uh, we are continuing to offer permanent ESL distance learning classes on our site. Uh, this is actually a state priority for the California Adult Education Program. Um, we're offering three evening ESL classes in the evenings, um, and we're we see the need for that as well too. Our school is actually pretty well known for its ESL program in the evenings. We have like a 200 person waiting list. Uh, this is really gonna help us be able to serve more students. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people have been to Sequoia Old School before. We're sort of a small building. We don't really have any more space for more classrooms. I mean, we have this waiting list with already putting 40 to 50 students in a classroom. Um, in addition to that, we're very proud of our partnerships, which we've either continued or established uh, with Kenyatta College. We've continued to transition students to their classes. Uh, we've also started that articulation program where students earn college credit through computer training um, through San Mateo County Libraries. Uh, so I had mentioned before that uh, a significant barrier for our students was access to high-speed internet. Um, 
Unfortunately, as our students were not eligible to receive district hotspots, we were able to partner with San Mateo County Libraries to be able to get uh, library hotspots loaned to our students for free. Uh, Vegan Outreach has been a completely invaluable partner for us. Uh, they helped us distribute food in the midst of the pandemic and they are continuing to assist us with that to this day. There's actually a food distribution that just happened like, a, like an hour ago. Uh, Upward Scholars is another major partner for us as well too. This is an organization that actually started at our school that uh, was started by a group of teachers and administrators. Uh, it is one of the first nonprofits, if not the first nonprofit, to provide scholarships to adult school students transitioning to community college. Uh, they assist with books, textbooks, transportation costs, such as parking and buses, bus passes as well too. And also uh, one of our other big milestones is we celebrated our 100 year anniversary, which uh, is our 100 year anniversary now. So Crystal, thanks for inviting us to present to the board last school year as well. So. So before I get into, into the sort of program areas for expansion and growth, and we're gonna talk about this more at the small school study session, but you know we're just sort of front loading a lot of this information now, so I don't have to be explaining so much at that, that small school study session. Um, you know, I, again, I, I recognize that the nature of our school is different from the high school side. So I think there needs to be a little bit of uh, information before we get into it as well. So, um, so one of the big things was just the student data that, that we got. So the parking need, as I'd mentioned before, students will circle around the, night, around the neighborhood for 20 minutes before they can find any parking. And oftentimes if they don't find parking then they just go home. Uh, that's obviously a very significant barrier to their education. Um, the other thing would be the California Adult Education Program. And this is what I had mentioned is our major funding source for our school. This uh, accounts for about like 75% of our school's revenue. This is priorities for this program for us to include issues of equity, uh, learner transition, program development, and technology and distance learning. Uh, also other things related to our growth opportunities, uh, there has been recent state legislation that has stated that adult education funding is only permitted for students over 18 with no exceptions. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we do have our WASC full self-study next year as well too. And uh, part of our action plan for our, through our midterm report, some items included recruiting and mentoring new teachers, which, you know, that's, that's everywhere these days, um, and increasing support services in collaboration with regional consortium. Um, also, a lot of our growth opportunities is, is through observance of other consortia uh, through Santa Clara County and other counties in the area. Uh, the Santa Clara County of the South Bay County of adult schools implemented 150 credit graduation requirement for all of the adult schools in uh, South Santa Clara County. So that's sort of a model that we're looking at right now. And 150. <laughs> and uh, this is something that we are uh, planning to propose to the board at some point as well. So. so the program expansion intentions. Uh, so we plan to discuss this in further detail at this, uh, the small school study session in December, but uh, we are looking to increasing our partnerships to offer more CTE classes. Uh, because of limited adult education funding, uh, we don't uh, have the revenue to be able to offer free CTE classes for us to be able to offer this at our site. We would have to charge thousands of dollars to our students, which through our surveys, they had indicated that they're not able to pay for that. Um, a solution to that would be to have partnerships with other organizations that could offer free or low priced uh, CTE classes such as Kenyatta College or Job Train. Uh, partnerships to offer ESL classes to evening waitlisted students is important for us as well too. As I mentioned, we have a large waitlist of students in the evenings. We'd like to be able to provide additional distance learning options as uh, prioritized by the California Adult Education Program, possibly within the high school equivalency programs. And we would also like to increase our support services network. And as far as growth opportunities, um, one of the things that I hear a lot from our teachers and our support staff would be more support for the newcomer minors. Um, as I mentioned before, in 2019, 2020, we had 60 minors that came into our school and that significantly impacted the, the, the culture of our school. Um, you know, I, I think some consideration 
can be thought of how this affects, especially for the miners, um, the academic support that they, that they receive, the support services that they receive, and also the effect that this has on the supervision of these miners as well. So um, just to sort of highlight this, um, when the miners come in, they often come in at the lowest level of ESL, which is three days a week for three hours per class. And that's the extent of the, the learning that they get. Um, so currently we have a part-time counselor that we share with Redwood High School. As I had mentioned before, we serve prior to the pandemic and it'll get back to this at some point, uh, 1200 students per year. And we have a part-time counselor for that. Um, so we predict that there's gonna be a lot, uh, a lot of need for a counselor with uh, a lot of what's been happening during the pandemic and students being transitioned to our school. I had mentioned about a lot of support service networks and expanding that network. So we will need assistance with that through a counselor. And uh, especially if we're having more minors come in as well too, then having a full-time counselor would really be able to support these students. Uh, professional development is another big growth opportunity. Obviously diversity, equity, and inclusion training is a huge focal point of our district. Uh, social, emotional learning as well too. Uh, the PD that we've been doing has been coming out of our budget. And if there is some way that we could leverage the district's training for our staff, that would be incredible. Um, the other thing to keep in mind as well too is because our teachers are not on SDTA, they are hourly teachers. We also uh, work with the, the additional hourly salary requirements of teachers attending these trainings as well. So. Um, so access to, to technology is another growth area. As I'd mentioned when I first came to the school, there was very limited access to technology. Now it's completely different. Um, so the technology systems that we get right now, you know, all the IT tech that come to our school have been great. They're very cooperative. They're very easy to work with. They're responsive. But we also get IT support like once a week, which uh, it would be great to have a little bit more. Um, with our facilities, um, I think some people are aware of this. Probably a lot of people are aware of this. We had originally... Um, this is before my time, before I started at Sequoia Adult School, but maybe like seven years ago or eight years ago. Uh, there was a lot of planning for a new building. There was a lot of the staff that sort of uh, had a lot of uh, stakeholdership in the design of the offices, the workspaces, a lot of investment of our staff in, a, in this new building. But unfortunately, a charter school came in and uh, uh, they were given that facility instead of our school. So our school has been at our location on Middlefield Road since 1989. And my understanding is prior to that, our school was like a meatpacking building. Um, so one of the implications of that is uh, we don't have any windows in our classrooms. We have like three windows in the building, really, uh, which is like the front office. So um, if you can imagine, that could have an impact on learning as well. So. Um, we don't have a parking lot either as well. So, I mean, fortunately, uh, Everest High School, uh, their principal has been gracious to allow our evening students to park in their parking lot in the evening. So that has been helping with the, with the parking and with the survey data that I, I believe that's what helps the parking situation a little bit in the survey data, but still, we're still encountering the, the issues of students just leaving and going home because they can't find parking. Um, I'm sorry? Uh, yes, sometimes, yeah. Um, so also the high school diploma graduation requirements, I had talked about how the South Bay Consortium of Adult Schools have adopted a 150 credit requirement. That's something that we're looking into. I've been actually in discussions with other adult school county directors about having the same thing as well. So I think uh, San Mateo Adult Schools had already actually lowered their credit requirement. It might've been to 150 already. Uh, also, new teacher recruitment. Uh, seems to be there's some good teachers in this room. If there's any uh, <laughs> interested, maybe uh, doing some night classes for some extra hourly pay, we would love to be able to promote that within the within the district as well. So, so that's my little pitch for that. I know everybody's excited about doing more teaching when they when they finish their regular schedules, right? Our students are great, though. Let me tell you. <laughs> So uh, that is my presentation. You know, I went on for a little bit, but thank you so much for your time and, and open to any questions, but we'll also be here on December 8th to talk more.
Sure, do you have it? Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation and all the work you do. Um, you know, we consistently hear from the community about the great job you do with your students. So thank you. Um, my mind was really stuck on the um, newcomer minors. Mm -hmm. And I had heard before, I, I know there's some concern about spending, sending minors to the adult school. And this is actually an example. I think every once in a while, like big decisions are made before your time. Dr. Williams, the big decisions are made and the board's not really a part of it. And to me, that's a huge decision to send minors to adult school. And I don't remember the board, but sometimes I have a bad memory. I don't remember any discussion from us. And I don't remember, I, I don't even really remember an update. I, I remember hearing about it from people in the community. And I would think, you know, in our quest to serve all kids, all kids means newcomer minors that come to our community. And I think they should be with students their age um, and with the wraparound that we have at our schools. So this is a great example where we say all kids. I don't understand how that, and maybe there's somebody that knows why we would make that decision. I know it's challenging because often they come with very high educational needs. Sure. But this is an example of all kids. Is there, and unless you tell me that, no, 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 they really should be going to the adult school. Is this something that we can talk about and reconsider? So um, I can't say though that the adult school gets something like a 20th of the uh, allocation per student as one of our high school sites. So the, the services that are available to the students are quite different from what would be available to a student at a high school site. Um, so I know that when there were 60 students that were referred to us uh, within a year, you know, we had classes where there would be 32 minors and four adults. And we lost all those four adults because they don't want to be in a class full of minors either. <laughs> um, so I that's what I could say. In I want to that. also say that since then, and thank you uh, for an informative presentation. And one thing that's important, 100 years standing, and you are a critical part of our district. Mm -hmm. And so this presentation has come about from a conversation that uh, I actually had with you and your staff. Mm -hmm. And one of the concerns raised um, centered around unaccompanied minors and uh, the support services the adult school was able to provide. Now, there was a season where you would get about 60 students. Since then, it's changed because we have newcomer uh, services that students are receiving through the high school. Um, also, one of the reasons I thought it was important that we have this presentation is to find an opportunity for the adult school teachers to uh, interact and interface with our high school teachers. Um, in a way of knowing exactly how instrumental the adult school program is in helping several of our students complete uh, their diplomas and then also offering the CTE pathways. And so to your point, uh, Trustee Dubois, we have started to address uh, the numbers. They have reduced tremendously uh, due to newcomer services. And we also understood that uh, the existing staff have been requesting or currently is requesting for additional training and support. Uh, should it become a need for uh, students, newcomer students to transition back to adult school? And that is a commitment um, that I have made to them uh, that we would have articulation with our wonderful high school uh, teachers as well. And then also uh, we would share best practices um, in an effort to provide greater support to our adult school teachers when serving high school students. Great. And I, I would also like to clarify that um, the age of the minors that are coming in are at least 17 years old. Um, they don't refer 14, 15, 16 year olds to us. Trustee Stevenson? Uh, no, they're, they're minors technically. 17, 17. <laughs> Sorry about that, my mask, yeah. First of all, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I just want to call you out a little bit in a good way. I was um, <laughs> <laughs> not calling you the carpet. I'm yelling at you. No, not doing that. Um, 
I remember when the superintendent first came on board and she did her entry plan and talked about her vision and goals and you responded with this thorough email okay. about um, how the Sequoia Adult School was in line, line by line, the vision and the goals of the district. So I just want to call you out for that. It takes a lot of, um, I think, courage as well as just quick thinking about um, how your program aligns with the rest of the district. It is easy to forget about Sequoia Adult School because it kind of is its own thing outside, you know, in conjunction with the district. So just wanted to take that time to acknowledge you for that. And, and just, I, it really showed your professionalism. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about and this might be clarification. I might ask you some questions in between the small school presentation. Sure, absolutely. I'm trying to figure out the data piece of it. I know that, you might tell me if I'm wrong. I know that we count our high school graduation rate as part of the, the reporting back to the state. How does Sequoia Adult School fit into that? Does theirs get counted into that? Is that separate? Are these kids dropped from our system? How does that, how does that work? Uh, they're counted separately. Uh, so our, our we work with a completely different database and system. So oh. students that graduate through us, uh, we, we no longer do concurrent enrollment. It's just if they're at our school, they're, they're our students. Okay. Um, and this is factored into uh, information that's sent to the CDE and uh, we get more funding based on graduates that we have as well. Today. Oh, okay. All right. I have questions about that, but I'll talk to you later. Sure, I can be happy to talk about it. <laughs> And then the other thing, one of the, in the PowerPoint, you talked about some of the social needs that families, um, some of the students are dealing with that could be a barrier to their education. Mm -hmm. A lot of those are really complicated. I just want to put that out there. Sure, sure, and absolutely. not really easy to, um, to address without partnership and without like a kind of a community schools model. Um, but there was one thing that was on there, which is childcare. Mm -hmm. um, and this is prior, well, prior to me being here, yeah. uh, that um, you used to work as far as child care um, with family connections. So if I look at um, Palo Alto community schools, they work with a child care mm -hmm. center and parent can get co-op hours, they can, and it will count towards something like it would, one, it would provide child care, but it also they could volunteer like a co-op one or two hours a week yeah. in order to pay for um that child care and they're included as part of the ratio numbers are you doing that anymore because i'm, I'm kind of lost about that now sure. um you know this is way before my time but uh so in 2008 there was like a 60 percent budget cut to our school and they closed a lot of programs um so there was child care at sequoia Adult school prior to that and all, I do know that that was uh, reduced or, or dissolves uh, because of the budget cuts. Um, I would need to look into future collaborations for child, but one of the challenges that we do have is just the, the capacity of our school, especially the, 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 the noise that would be <laughs> generated for, you know, we are a testing center as well too. So uh, they do need to have a specific testing environment, but I'm absolutely, interested in yeah. exploring that option Family connections was at a different site yeah and it was part of it was separated out but it was a part of the adult school and there was some credentialing yeah. i would strongly suggest us to think about if yeah. that is one area that we can respond to mm -hmm. is child care yeah. on a couple of ends meaning that um when you're thinking also about adults getting additional skills child care is one of them yeah um for the adult who wants to care for kids and increasing the teacher um rate that we need um, mm -hmm. because just like adults working with teenagers it is also happening to our babies mm -hmm. and people can't go back to work without that yeah. um and so i would hope that we as we grow and there's funding opportunities that we think of a co-op program that would help help the individuals to come back and finish up their GED. And we know GED or high school diploma. Um, and we know that that would impact how much they're making on the hour so that they don't have to deal with the social needs issues that are happening because it's basically about financial stability. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing I have a question about 
Um, you talked about parking. It is horrible. Mm -hmm. I just want to put that out there. Uh, and so, um, and thinking about that, I know where you guys are located. Is there any way that you can partner with like the Catholic church or Red, you know, I think Redwood City has a couple of schools that are around there. Is there any way that we can partner? Yeah, I, I mean, to lose people. Any any suggestions would be welcome. Like uh, there was that new parking lot that's you know like eight blocks down that they they created with that mural. Like I forgot which which street it's on, but um, you know we were in discussions of having our students be able to park there, but um, for some reason they ended up having a two hour parking limit even like in the evenings, which you know usually parking limits don't go into the evenings. That was a uh, one possibility for us to extend our parking for our students. Well, thank you so much. I enjoyed visiting you guys earlier. What, the beginning of the year? I don't know when we went. Well, I got left. Thank you so much. Uh, for all your support <laughs> you're going to drive me back to the district office. Um, so appreciate your staff and all that you guys do. So thank you for answering those questions. Absolutely. Oh, one more question. Go for it. Um, one of the things I did not know, I was trying to refer a student to your program. Uh -huh. um, and for some reason, they didn't know that we had an adult school around. Um, GVs and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. But there's a, I didn't know that there, and maybe, um, you know, Edith can share this with me, but there's a five schools charter program that does GED work. Yeah, job training. You know train. about that? It's a job train, right? Huh? Job train? Yep. Yep. Okay. So I just wonder if there also is some confusion between what Sequoia does and what they do as well. Mm. Yeah, that's that's the first time I've heard of that. I can yeah. definitely look into that. They do, do, do. Yeah, yeah, okay. they do. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. I, I am smiling underneath my mask. Yeah, because of a couple things Trustee Stevenson said, and Jonathan said, when you talked about the old ages, uh, Alan Sarver and I, I think, remember many of those issues, and we don't think of them as the old ages. The, the other uh, thing that I responded to and I was thinking about when Trustee Stevenson spoke was, it's impolitic when, when, somebody, when somebody from the district staff presents a list, sort of a wish list item to us, it's kind of impolitic to tell, for us to respond to that and say what's positive and what we're going to vote for, but but in the case of parking, uh, we were there for the wasp. I think it was, and the parking is atrocious. And I don't think you need to say another word about that, and we will understand what that's all about. Um, I am grateful to you and to our superintendent for setting this up because I don't think we hear enough from the adult school. Um, I always learn. Learned um, in this case, I think I, I learned one embarrassing thing, which is to say you've done a partnership with an institute that I host at Stanford, the Immigration Policy Lab, um, <laughs> and so I don't necessarily who see who they're doing studies with, but they do very important work. There, there are no common measures for understanding the integration of immigrants into into our country and other countries, and, and now I understand you helped out with that, so that's that's great. Um, the two points or questions I wanted to make. One concerns, uh, concerns the ESL program and the ELL work we're doing as a district and wondering if there's synergy and, and collaboration going on there. And just anecdotally, I would think some of those ESL folks that you're working with are parents of students in the district who, who also may be. And, and so um, are, are there conversations we're having are you part of the uh, the tri district collaboration with Stanford on that issue? Are there conversations at the very least? Sure. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. As far as the district collaboration, not yet. Um, as far as the work that Stanford has done, it's actually very related to um, our previous director. Lionel was actually part of this uh, organization called Allies that really advocated for immigrant integration metrics into um, adult learning as well. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so my understanding is the policy lab had uh, applied for a grant to be able to continue this work, but that didn't necessarily work out. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess I I hope we're able to leverage the work you're doing and the and the critical work that's happening in the district, helping English language learners. So it, it seems like a natural. The other question, an issue I wanted to bring up was about the budget, and might turn to our CBO as well for that. As I remember the budget we approved, um, the adult school has run a deficit and the deficit is funded through fund 11. Is that correct? Which in some ways is district money. 
I, I, is that not correct? Right, okay. But, but, but I do, is it correct to say it's, it's a district contribution to the support of the adult, adult school? Okay. Um, the, the other maybe bigger issue is that the adult school has run in deficit for a number of years. As I recall, you and the budget, it's, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, that there's a deficit this year, there was a larger deficit last year that I think you had to cut your budget by $400,000 or some substantial amount. I, I, the reason I raised the, raised the issues is questioning what the long-term hope and level of support for the school should be. Because one, if it's drawing on um, funds, a reserve fund, Fund 11, mm -hmm. that will gradually disappear. I think it's probably down to 1.2 million or something like that. Um, but should the board be aware of those things going forward? Um, so historically, we've actually been uh, in line with the budget. We, we, we've, we, we had a significant carryover for, for a little bit. Um, during the pandemic, we started going through a little bit of our runway um, just because of all the extra support that was needed, training for teachers, uh, you know, we helped paying for people to do food distributions, things like that. Um, also the extra distance learning classes that we established that also runs into a bit of a deficit with that as well too. One of the federal grants that we get, it, it, it the amount that we get is determined by learning gains that our students make. Mm -hmm. And so uh, with having more students, uh, the idea would be able to generate more revenue through this grant. Unfortunately though, because of the pandemic and the year before, the amount that we get through that grant is the same because if we were just basing it on the learning gains that we made, it would actually be lower. But what, what, what the federal government is saying is we're just gonna give you the same amount before. But what we're doing now is we're adding more classes. So our, our, our costs go up. In theory, our revenue should go up, but they're keeping the, the contributions the same. So that's another thing that's impacting our budget as well. So. And, and please understand, I raised the issue because it, one, I think you do important work for our community. Um, I think the board will have an interest in making sure there's stable funding for yeah. the adult school going forward. I'm confident that the board will, right? <laughs> there should. It should. We should. <laughs> uh, I guess w one question I had, you, you talked about, um, and I also, I want to thank you for the presentation. This is extremely valuable uh, and, and engaging in something that we haven't been engaged enough in for quite a while. Thank you. Uh, you talked about uh, pivoting quickly to um, distance learning mm -hmm. and that um, you have been back in session since September, uh, but not quite all activities are now in person. What, what does the, the balance feel like? Um, are there um, you know, substantial student populations uh, and classes that are continuing to take advantage of distance approach? Mm -hmm. Is being back in person really beneficial for a lot of what's going on? And, and how does that kind of reflect uh, the intentional uh, forward direction of really trying to build back better? Sure. Um, so the majority of our classes are back in person. Um, so when we opened uh, registrations for our ESL programs again, uh, the majority of the students that came in came back uh, because they wanted to have in-person classes. So there was a pretty good increase in students when we reopened the classrooms. On the other hand, because of all the COVID stuff that's, that's happening, uh, any symptom, they, gotta call, they can't come to class. They gotta go to the nurse. <laughs> they gotta get the clearance. And oftentimes, like, you know, I got a headache, I get migraines, you know, I still, well, sorry, you still got it, you know, it's health and safety of the school. So that has uh, decreased a decent amount of the enrollment. I mean, this is, this is not compulsory education. Everybody can come in. It's, I mean, the idea of adult education, community college, you know, you have the opportunity to take a break if something in your life comes up and come back. Uh, we are a free institution as well, too. Uh, we don't just let anybody in at any time. There is managed enrollment, but that's another thing that's uh, 
important to understand about how the adult school works compared to the other sites. Um, our high school equivalency and high school diploma enrollments actually went higher during the pandemic. And I think that that's a trend that happens for a lot of adult schools and community colleges. During uh, periods of unemployment, people look to sort of re-up their skills and go back to school. Uh, since the job market has been reopening, our numbers have sort of flipped for those programs. So uh, what we did find was a significant portion of those students in those programs uh, wanted to have some sort of online uh, option. And so what we did is, because we also surveyed those students as well too, there was a overwhelming demand to have some sort of hybrid option. So we have half in-person, half online. And enrollment for the online portion of that class is almost double for some of the sections. So the thing that's a little bit concerning for me is, are, are they actually learning? Because a lot of times I'll see the teachers engaging with students and there's no response or the, they might just be having the phone on in their work while they're doing their jobs or something like that. So uh, there has to be a little bit more of an analysis of the learning gains that's being made in, in, in those formats. Um, so ESL is generally down because of the things that I had mentioned before. Distance learning is actually doing okay, but in-person is down because of maybe the, the symptom tracking and all those other variables as well. Good point. Um, I think this was um, just tremendously valuable and a lot of, of really good data. And I'm looking forward to the, uh, the small schools study session. Absolutely. So thank you all for your time. And I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you. I feel like we should give a round of applause. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, let's move on to item 12.3, our COVID-19 update. Hello, good evening again. We wanted to give some information and some updates on data with COVID-19. And to do that, we have our Director of Student Services, Jared Dooley, as well as our Health and Wellness Co Coordinator, Javier Gutierrez, who are here to present that for you this evening. Is the presentation going to get put up? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Josue. You could go to the next slide. Do I control it? Oh, I got it up here. Thank you. Okay, so this presentation will focus uh, mostly on our testing program, our partnership with Worksite Labs, and some requirements that we have. Uh, this shows you that we have had a significant number of COVID-19 tests this school year with our partnership with, with Worksite Labs. You'll notice that our large sites have uh, the most tests uh, at those sites. It makes sense if we keep in mind that those are our compre four large sites have uh, higher frequency of testing with two days a week available to test there. Um, they also have athletics, which uh, brings sometimes more needs uh, to test our students there for athletics. Uh, also, they have a higher student population. And as John mentioned, with the symptom tracking, we may require a, a COVID-19 test to return to school. And so with the higher student population, it's more likely that they'll get tested there. Um, and then also a reminder that anyone can test at any site. So even uh, the, the number of tests completed at a specific site aren't necessarily all just for students or staff or that school, that specific school community as uh, our testing is available at uh, open to anyone at any of our school sites. That's also a little plug there. Um, you'll notice that the weekly tests do fluctuate and that again could be due to the different 
uh, needs that come up uh, if there's a different athletic need or a case that requires uh, exposure or testing after exposure or a student absence. Uh, we'll figure out how to skip to the next slide here. Uh, I, I am pressing it. There we go. Uh, so this has resulted in, uh, as of November 8th, 2,492 tests. This provides more information to ensure that our schools are safe. This helps us ensure that uh, symptomatic uh, people can return once they aren't symptomatic. Um, and also just to make sure that our schools are kept safe if we need to respond to any positive results. I'm pushing down, there we go. So we, uh, we have identified 13 uh, positive cases through our district testing program. Uh, this either identifies them or it may confirm a positive case that uh, we already suspected. Uh, due to the protocols that we have in place to ensure our school safety. Um, again, this helps us respond when we confirm the positive case and enter the protocol if we need to, keeping our schools safe. And additionally, this is not representative of all of our positive cases, just the ones that uh, are identified through our district, district testing program in collaboration with Worksite Labs. Just a plug uh, for all total ca positive cases, there is a dashboard on the district website, which uh, includes all totals of positive cases um, across the uh, school district and sites. So as you see on this slide, uh, just a little additional information <clears throat> as to uh, timing of test popularity. We see a, a quick surge in the morning hour just before school, uh, a large surge in the um, early afternoon, which is likely due to uh, with athletics coming back around in full swing, especially as we have um, uh, currently in the winter season, some required testing for uh, activities such as wrestling. We see a, a positive blip there in the one to two o'clock um, hour, especially as they test uh, within their site, likely right before activities um, for the day. Um, you can see our age group uh, data here. Uh, we will be modifying this moving forward, so it is much more specific that we can separate from students and adults. Here we have an age of uh, all of our students uh, below 18. Obviously, we do have some 18-year-olds within our district attending uh, schools as students, and so some of those 18-year-old students are included in the 18, year, uh, 18 and above data um, however, it does give a picture that we are hitting a, a good blend of adults and students testing on a weekly basis across the entire district. As you can see, those um, seven day average number of tests are pretty close to each other. Moving on to uh, some information around vaccination rates as well as required testing. Uh, this is a data table, and I want to briefly uh, provide a little more background prior to just looking at uh, percentages. This table is titled the Verified Vaccinated Workers Across the District. Uh, there was a state health order uh, that was signed and implemented uh, earlier this school year with the requirement for all uh, school district workers across the state to be um, vaccinated by October 15th, and if not vaccinated, fully vaccinated, that they would be required to test weekly. So in preparation uh, for implementation of that uh, state order by October 15th, the school district, uh, our staff did a lot of work to communicate with staff, um, all of our workers, which is not just certificated and classified, this is also 
substitute teachers, uh, contractors and partners, short-term staff members, coaches, et cetera. This is a large number of uh, workers across our school district. And so, as you can see, right after the order went into effect, uh, we have a first uh, column there, October 19th, 21. You can see our percentages um, across a number of the school sites, as well as a district-wide percentage. Um, this is not inclusive of all of our sites. There are some kind of outliers, uh, like an example of maintenance and operations. However, this is uh, a good, good percent of all of the workers um, at our sites. But we did uh, wanted, I did want to put in a data uh, representation for the district office subs, contractors, et cetera. That is our largest group. And as you can see, that's the, the, the data across both dates that are listed in the table that is significantly lower than the rest. Now, because that is the largest group, uh, what that does is unfortunately brings down the district wide percentage, just overall trying to kind of explain the overall data table, just looking at um, why our overall district wide at 85% may be significantly lower um, than seeing that percentage at the sites, okay? Good thing, the percentages all are going up, which is fantastic and phenomenal. And, and this data, again, is also listed in the dashboard. Th this is, these are percentages, again, that are verified to be fully vaccinated uh, across the sites. We still, though, can end up with staff members that are vaccinated that still have yet to submit their verification documents. Those numbers are very few as we've been working diligently and communicating with all of those staff members, as we'll see on the, on the next slide as well. Fine. For the people that aren't vaccinated, do you have any data, anecdotal or otherwise, about you expect the numbers to keep getting better? It's just people haven't had a chance yet. I mean, it's been almost a year, or is it people yes. are reticent? Or I, I would say yes, that since we started tracking data, more individuals, more staff have uh, become fully vaccinated, but also more staff have uh, submitted their verification documents as well. So it's kind of a blend of both. You're, you think if we see another report in a month or two, it'll be better again? I certainly would hope so, yes. We have, we have one uh, full-time staff member in our department that is quite literally looking at line-by-line -line data almost all day. So yes, <laughs> I think that uh, certainly that, that staff member in question is really uh, the driving force behind seeing those percentages climb. Additionally, they could, so the staff that are not fully verified, uh, in addition to maybe not having submitted it, can also decline to state. And they would, uh, even if they are fully vaccinated by choosing uh, to decline to state, you uh, enter into the category of requiring to test because we have not verified they're fully vaccinated. So they are also included in that, um, in that, in these numbers here of staff that are required to test, uh, again, either because they have not submitted their fully, uh, they have not submitted and verified their fully vaccinated status. They have not responded, or sorry, that's the same one. Um, they have not been vaccinated or they declined to state. So all those three categories are included in these number here, in these numbers here of our staff that are required to test. Um, you could see our classified numbers, both, both categories, um, of employees classified and certificated. As you see over the weeks, uh, we have decreased the number that are required to test. And so that kind of answers your question, uh, Trustee Ginn, where uh, on uh, the week of October 22nd, we had 152 classified members, uh, classified staff members that were required to test. And most recently that was down to 92. Yeah. So over these uh, four weeks, we have had significant number of more employees at least submit or confirm they are fully vaccinated. Um, and so again, this is a, a state order, state health order that uh, Jarrett referred to earlier. And as you can see, we don't have, uh, 
everyone meeting that requirement to test. And to address that, I uh, also want to point out that management isn't included in this. We have an extremely low number of management there and, and did not want to make that an identifiable um, number there. So uh, to address this, we uh, have communicated the process and provided the information to managers so that they can follow up with staff that uh, need to meet this requirement. We update that weekly, again, in collaboration with our testing partner, Worksite Labs. Um, staff are required to, that are required to test need to do so through Worksite Labs to facilitate uh, data management and have that information uh, quickly and efficiently to managers to follow up with staff. Um, so again, we update that weekly and our health staff is a big part of that uh, as well in, in managing that data as Jared stated earlier. Uh, we've collaborated with county council for uh, a legal and appropriate response to uh, staff members that are not meeting the requirement. I also want to appreciate uh, the collaboration with SDTA to um, encourage these staff members to meet the requirement. I appreciate that. And uh, finally, we have uh, finalized a policy bulletin that will be sent uh, tomorrow, I believe, to all managers. Uh, uh, outlining this requirement and uh, what we received from County Council in terms of the response to that. One more, and I think that's it. Thank you. All right, before uh, we go to the board comments, I do have one uh, public comment card for this from Abby Corman. I'm going to face you since I'm <laughs> speaking to you. Um, I appreciate this uh, presentation and the easy access to COVID testing for staff, students, and the community now with Worksite Labs. I, I am surprised that I'm still receiving emails from site leadership about my exposure to COVID. Uh, my understanding was that this contract was meant to support our staff whose already full jobs had sort of been overtaken by COVID expectations and legal requirements. So I'm wondering if we can have an update on the hopefully reduced strain and load COVID testing, tracing and communication has on site and district staff now that we have this partnership. The vaccination rates and our numbers are important, but I, I'm also interested in, like I said, hopefully this reduced strain on our staff members so they can focus on their already full job descriptions. Thank you. Uh, if, if I could just kind of talk to that a little bit, I, I believe that uh, what we were looking at in establishing the partnership with Worksite Labs was that the tremendous added burden of uh, COVID testing tracking was something that the district recognized was completely inappropriate and, and impossible for our, our staff to be expected to achieve and that we needed uh, this external partnership to be able to effectively do it. Uh, so uh, what we're really looking at here is, is a mitigation of the impact of all of this additional work going on, not, not that we had illusions that somehow that was going to make life easier than if, if the requirement wasn't there at all. Um, you know, as you've said, there are there's at least one dedicated staff member to, <laughs> pouring over the numbers continuously to, to be working on implementing the policy um, impacts that come out of, of what the numbers are actually saying. Uh, to me, at least, this is a level of uh, tracking and management that is part of, of the additional burden we're all facing coming out of the pandemic into the new normal. Um, and the way we're all sitting here talking through masks tonight is a reminder that we are coming through the latter stages. We are not out of it by any means. And 
I think that's why we are continuing to have these updates and these concerns and the recognition that, that the workload on all of us uh, continues to be extraordinary. Okay. Um, first, I want to say you guys have worked so hard, and I'm very grateful for all that you've, that you've done. Thank you. Um, I saw somewhere uh, the student vaccination rates at Redwood are low, right? Is there anything we can do about that? And um, we, uh, we did not share that data tonight, but um, you, it may have been shared with you. Uh, the student data or the data that we have regarding student vaccination rate uh, was we, we got that from the California Immunization Registry uh, for the those vaccinations that are verified through the state. Um, and uh, I want to point out that if you look at the chart of testing sites, uh, our larger schools have it twice a week. Our smaller schools rotate once a week uh, each month. However, East Palo Alto Academy uh, is weekly. So they are uh, the small school that does have it every week, um, kind of in response to what you're saying. So if you look at the smaller schools there, uh, you'll notice that they have the higher, highest number of tests at their site. And uh, I hope that is to support um, that, uh, to support them because of what you said that they have a lower vaccination rate. Uh, you addressed a little bit that um, we are working to put a little bit more teeth into the meaning of requirement for testing. Um, and clearly the, you know, the, the state directive of proof of vaccination or regular testing is intended as a requirement as not only uh, a safeguard for the entire community, but an ongoing incentive to help convince um, the reluctant um, to, to become vaccinated. Um, and, and clearly we need to be effective at, um, at enforcing the requirement in, in the sense that it, it truly is a, a requirement and not just um, a positive gentle encouragement. Um, so, you know, that, that's one of the places where, as an agency, our district gets put in a hard place of, um, yes, we have a partner in Worksite Labs, but we are still um, saddled with the burden of being um, vaccination police. Um, and uh, so I, I, I appreciate that we are trying to, to do that in as positive um, yet clear cut a manner as possible and moving forward. Um, certainly to me, the, the kinds of percentages we're, we've been looking at there um, shows that, that it, it needs to be a little firmer as we go. County Council confirmed that. Okay. Um, okay. And, and you know, we've, we've kind of touched a little, a little gently on, you know, the fact that there is uh, another whole side of this to tracking um, and doing anything about student vaccination and testing rates. And we know that there was, we have received general guidelines from the state um, that quite likely by the start of next school year, um, it will be uh, a standard requirement um, for registration, like um, many other vaccinations, to, to give that proof. Um, is there anything that you are sensing um, of, of a movement and a need for uh, a district like ours to be actively considering trying to put in place student vaccination mandates um, at a sooner date, are we are we trending strongly enough along the path we wish to go with vaccination um, of students that 
you know that that we feel that the environment is is continuing to become safer. I think with anything on this, we're definitely following the guidance of CDPH and our county health. Um, and so we'll, we'll continue to do that and look to them for the guidance around this, you know, and as that transition's happening, what we can do and what supports and resources we can offer to make a smooth transition as the state and county change their guidelines. Yeah, certainly, you know, as, as we know, um, our superintendent was for the board uh, put together uh, a letter to the governor's office asking for the statewide action and guidance and trying to take individual school districts out of um, the leading edge of trying to be the health officials, but to be agencies that were capable of following the, the state delivered guidelines. Um, but part of what we need to be doing clearly is, is keeping our eye on the data, seeing what's going on and, and remaining aware of whether um, anything more aggressive uh, needs to be considered down the road. So appreciate that feedback. I have a comment on that. I support your statement that we should follow what the state says. And I'm uncomfortable saying we wanna do something different just to just let us not be confusion. That, well, that's your opinion. I, I would want to follow the state's guidelines. And I just ask that the board receive a copy of the um, the um, bulletin. You mentioned the bulletin. When it's available, I'd be interested to see it. Yes, we, we plan to push that out tomorrow, so we'll share it with you as well. Other board comments or questions? Thank you very much. I think it might be um, a pretty good time for us to consider a quick break before we turn the corner to our uh, our set of uh, uh, bargaining proposals and the other discussion items. Um, so if uh, the board is in accordance, okay, let it is uh, 8.04 according to our clock, which is now running on standard time uh, with us. Uh, very nice change. Uh, let's let's aim for uh, uh, reconvening at 8.15. Okay, it looks like we are back and the clock on the wall says 8.15. So we're doing doing good here. All right, so let's move to our cavalcade of uh, bargaining proposals. We'll begin with 12.1, uh, the presentation of the Ask Me initial bargaining proposal to Sequoia in your high school district. Good evening. I'm wearing a couple different hats tonight. Um, I don't think any of them are the business one, but we'll see. I'm sure there'll be dollar signs somewhere for us to talk about. Okay. So 12.1, which became 12.3, is the presentation um, of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, also known as AFSCME here, uh, their local 829 office. Um, and it is their presentation of their initial bargaining proposal to our district. The public has provided the opportunity to comment to the Board of Trustees about initial proposal uh, presented um, within the board docs tonight. And I do have that open. Um, there are several articles that are open. Um, for the record, Article 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, not 12, that's why, that's why I'm reading them, um, 13, 14, 15, and 19. 
So it also says that AFSCME will propose other specific contract language regarding wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment persistent to this notice and the negotiations process. So I ask that the board um, acknowledge um, this information item of sunshining from AFSCME to the district. Okay, uh, I do not have any public comment cards uh, and I don't see any hands going up among our attendees. Does uh, any member of the board have any questions or comments at this time? We will acknowledge having that been presented to us. Thank you. All right, with that, let's swing around and I bet you get to put on a different hat. I do, same, same hat, different side. Okay, so this next um, presentation is actually a public hearing. Um, it needs to be operated as a public hearing president server. Um, and it's the presentation from Sequoia Union High School District's initial bargaining proposal to the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, again, also known as AFSCME. The district is um, proposing um, negotiations around Article 6, which is health and welfare, Article 8, evaluation, Article 11, discipline procedures, Article 8, wages, and classified reclassification processes. The district has an interest in modifying and updating contract language to be consistent with the new and current law, uh, for example, um, in the discipline section. Um, and the term of the agreement, the district has an interest in a three-year agreement term with re-openers, two re-openers by each party each year. Okay, I'm impressed with the facility with Roman numerals. Um, so with that, um, we will open the public hearing, take comments from members of the public in attendance and uh, attendees online. And I do not see any cards coming in. I do not see any hands going up. And with that, we will close the hearing. Thank you. So now we will move to our action item 15.1 to complete our trifecta here, um, which is the action to approve the Sequoia Union High School District's initial bargaining proposal to ask me. And at that, this point, I'll ask, um, let's see. Dr. Williams, uh, you're in charge of that. We have we have uh, been presented the proposal. Let's make a motion that we um, approve. What do we do? Approve the initial bargaining proposal. I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. When we take action, we take action. That has been approved. Okay, so we will now move on to our discussion items. Um, item 14.1. Oh, look who's wearing a new hat. Discussion this is, this is not a hat I've worn before representing Ms. Hansen. So um, please offer some grace here. Um, this is a discussion item. Um, so any questions or comments, I will make sure to um, pass along back to um, Ms. Hansen. This item will come back to you as an actionable item on December 15th. So the Educator Effectiveness Grant, that is not a new grant um, for our district um, or for across districts um, throughout California. The, form, the funding formula, which I can speak to, um, is based off of a percentage of employees, both classified and certificated. Um, the use of these funds are highly reg regulated. 
Um, they can be used for coaching and mentoring staff, um, serving in instructional setting, such as beginning teachers um, or administrator induction. So this money can actually be spent on administrators. A lot of funding that we get from the state um, does have a restriction to not be spent that way. Um, it can be spent on programs that lead to effective standards aligned with instruction or to improve instruction in literacy, uh, practice and strategies that re-engage pupils that lead to accelerated learning, strategies to implement social emotional learning, trauma-informed practice, practices, and practices to create a positive school climate. Uh, strategies to improve inclusive practices, including but not limited to universal design for learning, um, and best practices for early identification and development of individualized education programs. Instruction and education to support implementing effective language acquisition, so our EL learners, and any new professional learning networks for educators not already engaged in an education related professional learning network. Um, two more, instruction, uh, education and strategies to incorporate ethnic studies um, and instruction, education and strategies for certificated and classified educators in early childhood education and child development. So as you can see, it is it stands by what its name is, which is educator effectiveness. So the uh, template currently has a proposal of two areas. Um, one is under the classification of coaching and mentoring staff by uh, the district offering um, or expanding our develop our own. Um, currently our develop our own is for classified employees who wish to become teachers. This expansion would target our teachers to become administrators. Come to the dark side. Yes. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 I know, I know, I'm sorry. Okay, and then, um, <laughs> come to the light. Okay. Another area will be practices and strategies that re-engage pupils. Um, so all certificated and classified staff will have training on trauma-informed practices and restorative practices. Um, and then lastly, what's noted here um, are strategies to implement social emotional learning, um, trauma-informed practices, um, again, and um, the district is proposing that we do this through wellness advisors uh, to further support staff and students in the implementation of trauma-informed practices. So that could look like certificate, certificated and classified um, support staff, um, that those would be uh, new positions. This is a four-year grant. Um, it's hard to say if this money is here to stay because it's the second, I believe the second or the third cycle that the state has issued um, this type of funding. So again, uh, this item is for discussion with an adoption um, coming back to you in December. Thank you. Uh, before the board begins discussing, we do have one speaker card so far from Ms. Salvatore. Um, I looked over the district's plan and SDTA is very pleased with the addition of the new um, developing our own administrative um, effort. We see this as a crucial way to help us install and follow those plans for um, equity and diversity and supporting that in our administrative ranks, the same way that we see the developing our own teacher program, having those results bearing that fruit among our teaching ranks. Um, we also would love similar programs to interest uh, our uh, classified staff or certificated staff in becoming uh, psychologists, counselors, adding other types of credentials in very hard to staff areas. Roughly 80 to 85% of the funding is set aside for this new position of wellness advisors. And I am intrigued by that because it's not a position that I'm familiar with. 
And I know we don't have a current uh, job description for it. So I look forward to working with whoever is going to be in charge of developing that um, so that we can have some SDTA input on what the um, role and description of that job will entail. Thank you. Um, Chris, I saw your eyebrows raised earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go back up. Uh, first, I'd like to say, I think every item on here seems like it deserves support, that they're all going to help move the, I'm supportive of all of them. They'll move the district forward. Um, that said, I have two questions, uh, which maybe the super, I ask of the superintendent. There's a longer list of needs that might qualify for this grant. Could you say a word about how you, how these items were prioritized? <laughs> Yes, thank you, um, Trustee Thompson. What uh, the staff, we came together and we looked at uh, our goals and then our data. We also looked at the allocation to uh, other funds like our ESSER one funds where we have provided additional support for our EL uh, learners and for training for our teachers around um, strategies to teach our EL learners and so for this we wanted to make sure that we hone in especially on uh, providing opportunities for our students um, to receive enrichment uh, rarely we get opportunities that we can actually uh, allocate uh, resources towards uh, enrichment and looking for um, innovative opportunities to support our students who are advancing um, above and beyond we also had the opportunity and we thought uh, about our goals alignments is that we wanted to make sure that we have staff uh, prepared, but then also that we are providing some type of support in response to the need uh, for emotional, social emotional support, not only for mm -hmm. students, but for staff. And so if we can alleviate some of the pressure that we have on the campus as a result of the pandemic, and we have some funds available to do that, then we see that in, in the form of wellness advisors. And we do look forward to collaborating with SDTA uh, in terms of what that might look like for a resource. And then the other piece, the final piece um, in terms of the restorative practices, we know with the wellness advisors, we also wanna make sure that we have a focus on alternative strategies where we can respond to the needs of all students that it doesn't seem punitive or feel punitive because mm -hmm. we also realize that we are in a difficult uh, season, if you will, difficult climate. And sometimes uh, behavior, we see behavior first before we see the root cause. And so we wanna make sure that we have skilled professionals in addition to the ones who are providing services to our community already, but additional support uh, to continue to push that agenda and initiative in favor of supporting all students. Um, and so that's basically the conversation that we had. We wanted to be able to be innovative and provide resources that we are not providing in other areas. That's very helpful. The, the only other question I have, it concerns the developing our own administrator cohort, which is a program that makes a lot of sense to me and I think will be important for the district. It's the only item on here that's offered just in the first year. So what, what are the assumptions about subsequent years? And so we are looking at sustainability. And so we are also funding um, Grow Your Own. We have alternative funding for that program as well. And so uh, we know that there's a big push to uh, have folk join the workforce for educators and teaching because it's a wonderful profession. And so we wanted to extend um, resources this year uh, to see if we could encourage more folk to um, to join the program. So it's a pilot pilot. And effort. then also um, we wanted to support uh, some of our current staff members who are uh, seeking a master's or administrative credential as well. And so that will be embedded in your role your own. So not only uh, those um, paraprofessionals who are working towards becoming a teacher, but also our existing staff members who are seeking administrative credentials as well. Primarily and specifically with um, the San Mateo County Office of Education. Presumably the, the results of that would come back to us and Absolutely. there might be an ongoing activity. Yes. All right, thank you very much.
Okay, I, I did jump prematurely into uh, engaging the board in the discussion because I received a second speaker card before Ms. Salvatore was done speaking and I didn't act on it. So uh, Abby Corman put in a, uh, a card I'd like to hear before we let all the other trustees take their next whack at it. Hi again. Uh, I'd like to echo Edith's comments um, about um, supporting the grow your own, growing the grow your own program. Um, I just have a couple of questions about um, this. In regards to Grow Your Own, I'm wondering if there are efforts um, or preference to diversify our admin. Are we encouraging particularly our BIPOC teachers? We have an overrepresentation of white women like myself teaching our students, and that representation in teachers also currently plays out in our admin, although we love them very much. Um, it would be helpful, I believe, if we're doing this to also be encouraging purposefully and strategically our BIPOC staff to take advantage of this opportunity um, and give preference to them when they're applying. So I just want to first name that and ask around it. Um, and then secondly, um, in regards to the wellness advisor position, I'm thrilled about it as that speaks to my public comment from before. I'd like to reiterate again my concern, which is also Susie Cho's concern, which is also Trustee Stid Nosuna's concern and many other concerns. I'm hoping that this position is student facing, that this person directly engages with students. I'm wondering if this person will, if it'll be this person at every site, is this a rotating position, someone who roams, is their office at the district? And again, that question really is just to, um, make sure our funds are directly impacting our students urgently right now instead of just down the line in the next three or four years making plans so just want to reiterate that concern and kind of ask those two questions thank you would you like to respond to Elizabeth? the general response and thank you um for the reminder and a gentle uh reminder and also uh, support. We do rec recognize um, as your superintendent and also the cabinet and the um, governance team, we recognize that the sense of urgency around support needed at school sites uh, in terms of the social emotional needs. Ideally, uh, when we thought about the wellness position or wellness advisors, these are folk who would go to the school site. And so as we are continuing to think through uh, what it would look like. I do want to just let you know, uh, these are positions or supports that will be given to the school site. Uh, we will talk about the amount, uh, what the system of rotation may be, but definitely the intention is to support, provide direct support uh, to students and to staff with a sense of urgency. Um, um, thank you so much. Um, I'm actually very interested in this. So I want to. Um, I can't wait to hear more about the wellness advisors. I actually have asked Bonnie on the side. So I'm trying to be mindful that that still stepping in, and, <laughs> and so I know we're going to do a second reading. But I do. I'm. I'm. Um, I just want to thank our STDA person, Edith, um, for bringing this up. I don't know why I didn't think of it myself, considering I'm a social worker. Um, <laughs> But I would love to see um, somewhere in there grow your own around some of our mental health and um, counseling staff. I know teachers can also get um, piece, uh, persons, uh, pupil credential to do counseling and things of that sort. So there is ways to kind of move around. Um, so I'm not for sure if this is the moment or if this is, is the grant, but I would like for us to think about that because I also heard there's not enough counselors at the schools. Um, and I think really, it's not just about BIPOC for counselors, we just can't find it anywhere. Um, so love to see that. And then I know that somehow tie this to the County Office of Ed, because I know that they do the NMT training around trauma-informed trauma schools um, and things of that sort. The other piece I don't see in here as far as training, there's two pieces around training and I'm not for sure if this is the right grant. So I'm just putting it out there, Dr. Williams, um, is that um, I actually am wondering around parenting. I know we have a great parenting program, but for families um, who are struggling with our restorative practice model, 
Um, I just linked back um, a community member to talk to a local school because they were like, we don't understand that restorative practice stuff. <laughs> and so it, I don't know if it translate culturally, right? So when I say that, yeah, I don't want my kid to be suspended or things like that, but hey, that might be exactly what they need. That's kind of the approach that some families are coming from. So I don't know how much is that is providing some education into our community about what is restorative practices for, for, the, for the parent um, per se. Per se. Um, so that was one piece. Um, and then I was gonna say something ingenious, but I, I can't think of it now, I'll come back later. Um, it was something, oh, training. I know what I was gonna say, it came back. Um, the parent liaisons at schools, sometimes they're called community liaisons, sometimes they're called parent liaisons. That is a very hard role. Um, and I want to figure out how to get those individuals um, connected to some ongoing professional training or coaching. Um, it is kind of a mod cause role um, sometimes at sites. And that's not because people don't, you know, um, like the role or anything like that. I think schools just have a, a lot of like gray areas and sometimes those individuals are there. Um, and thinking of them, this is my own term, nobody has adopted it but me. Um, but I think of like those front offices as well as welcome centers with kind of a team around them, which is like the parent liaison. I don't know what this wellness advisor is gonna do, but people who help families navigate sites um, and, um, and so I'm just wondering what's the larger vision, um, you know, cause I know this is funding, but like, what's the larger, what's the larger vision? Okay. Thank you. Other board discussion? Um, I had, I had a couple that actually, um, Crystal might be a, a little bit closer to, to your wheelhouse. I, um, I'm, uh, I, I would echo what's already been said. I'm very pleased at, uh, in general, the way the, uh, uh, the this grant is being aimed, and I think I think there's a lot of appropriate thoughtfulness in prioritization that's going on, and it um, just just the wording of what's on offer in the grant or what's appropriate to the grant is. A delineation of what are the priorities of the district. So it, it, it's a matter of another opportunity to align some of the available funding with the intended um, direction. And I think that's great. Um, so I, first of all, it looked to me like in a lot of the categories, the amount of funding we were allocating on a yearly basis was, was approximately one or two uh, full-time equivalents. And um, so I, I think that, um, you know, as we've just touched on, there's going to be a lot of interest in, in how that actually plays out. And obviously that's details down the road uh, from here, whether, whether we're talking about adding a full-time equivalent at a given site, or if we're doing a district-wide role that moves around, or if we're adding a point two or a point four responsibility at each site or, or, or what it would be. Uh, the other kind of observation and question I had is that this seems to be kind of a unique in-between sort of a funding structure. This is not really one-time money, nor is it really permanent funding. It is a multi-year commitment. And it seems that with it, we are looking at adding full-time employee long-term headcount, knowing that we've got a five-year um, window of, of funding covered, but we're still looking at uh, a probable five-year out sunsetting. And uh, it seems like we are, to, to a certain extent, making a commitment to you know, add ongoing um, resource to the district and knowing that we're likely to have to readdress the funding at the end of the five years. Um, and I just, I just wanted to kind of throw that out and, and, and see your thoughts on that. Thank you. 
Um, we do track all business considered restricted funding, right? So any positions that are attached to restricted funding are monitored and um, will exist first and foremost, as long as funding is available. And then as we know that the funds are sunsetting, then we would have to look and see if other areas of the budget could absorb them. Um, educator effectiveness um, kind of came in light as the governor um, was moving away towards one-time funding, right? And so this was like the first of the rollout with these templates and how can we um, provide districts with funding with some specific um, identifiers, right, outside. Um, this plan looks a little thin. The the regulatory items that can be spent on are the same regulatory items that we spend all the COVID dollars we have, right? And so this is really duplicated um, for districts right now, which is definitely a cause of concern as a state level, right, is because we are adding these resources that, that we believe are going to help. They will become a part of us and then what do we do when the funding goes away? Um, and so that's definitely something that we need to be mindful of um, and make sure we address as we know that these funds are sunsetting. Yeah, I, I think to me it's, you know, it's it's a great boost in the right direction, but we recognize it's it's a longer than usual, but still limited time with a sunset in there. And, and we'll, we'll need to be mindful of thinking about what we do next as the fifth year approaches. Yeah. All right. uh, any other comments? Otherwise, we will deem this to have been discussed. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, now we move on to item 14.2, the discussion of the East Palo, Palo Alto Academy Educator Effectiveness Grant. And I understand that uh, Crystal Leach has been designated to make the presentation in place of Amica. <laughs> Had I known, I would have been enjoying dinner with my family. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you, Crystal, for setting the stage. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, good evening, board, President Sarver, uh, Superintendent Williams, and our, our new cabinet. Very exciting. I am here to bring forth the East Palo Academy version of this. Two areas that we're trying to make better for, no, for um, lack of a better description. <laughs> One is something very specific we've noticed in our MTMDSS work is uh, under number three, re-engage pupils and lead to accelerated learning. In our MTMDSS work, we're noticing that there is a need for the students who are still general ed students, not qualified for special education through an SST of 504, or otherwise they're what I like to call on our radar. And so what we're trying to figure out is, can we puzzle together some funds for having an individual at a, the rate of an IA? Uh, we actually um, have some folks in mind who have special ed background, but are not qualified to teach in uh, California yet, who are interested and could potentially apply for such a position. And so what we're looking for, there's three categories, as I mentioned before, the 504, the SST, and as we're all noticing right now, very dangerous are the students who've been absent for multiple days because of the COVID rules. We have an ADA right now, ordinarily our ADA is 95%. Right now it is at 89%. And thankfully the way the rules work, I hope this is not a fake news, is that the ADA that we're working with for our budget is the better of the two for the last two years. It's not this year's actual ADA because Lord have mercy, that would really kill us. Uh, but what it's more important, because someone asked me, are you concerned about the budget? I said, I, I could care less about the budget. Where are those children and why are they not in school and what are they missing? So our hope is that we can create a system where upon re-entry, re well, first they can call them at home, get them on the phone and help them figure out their canvas over the phone. And they can really engage them in the learning. And when they come back, a lot of them have been showing a lot of anxiousness and anxiety. I'm sure as a classroom teacher, you see this where they don't know how to re-engage because they've been gone for a week. And so what can we do to help bridge that return so they feel confident? Okay, I've been gone for a week, but I'm gonna be okay. So that's our hope with, I mean, it's really just 15,000 a year for our little school, but something that we can put towards that. And then second, this one has been really difficult. 
for section number four around expanding the mental health services. We, as you know, are very blessed to have the partnerships we have, but we still need more tier two interventions, small group interventions. I have called maybe six different mental health organizations, which I don't know, maybe it's not a lot. If you know more, let me know. I can send you the list of who we've called. We're trying to find someone qualified to run small groups because that's what we really need. We don't have, a, we know we can't do enough with one-on-one. -on -one. That's just not gonna happen, but we could beef up our tier two. Unfortunately, we're not getting what we need. So we might have to do like tier two light and maybe we won't get a qualified therapist. Perhaps we'll just get a really good nonprofit partner. I can imagine when you were, for example, at Boys and Girls Club, you could totally do small groups. So we have to be careful how we do that, but the intention is to expand SEL groups, small groups, tier two interventions. That's what we are hoping to do. <laughs> for EPAA, as you saw, it represents about 130K divided for the two years uh, and it divided equally at this point is our hope. I, I think for me, it's, it's very illuminating to compare the, the, um, the funding going through the whole district and the funding <laughs> going through EPA, because really what it reminds us is, is you know, this talk at the district level about one FTE or two FTE for a district of 9,000 students. Yes. <laughs> um, and, you know, that, that numbers, you know, in excess of a couple million dollars look like there's some real change being laid on the table. Um, but then when you look at, you know, the range of $100,000 for one school, you realize that it, it's really all proportional. And what we're, what we're talking about once again is it's not quite another underfunded mandate, but it's kind of like the doors open a little bit for a look inside the candy shop and you can go in and you can, you can grab a couple of things, yeah. but it's, it's, it's small potatoes of, of real meaningful change. It is more an opportunity and a directive to us to, to focus our attention on what are the priorities, where are places that we can make a, a specific kind of difference mm -hmm. and then get the momentum going of really the school and the district taking on more long-term obligation of actually making it work and, and the change we wanna make really goes far beyond what this funding opportunity presents. Well, we hope we won't need this many small groups once we get our students and everyone over this recovery from the pandemic. We hope and we pray that we can give everyone the tools and the energy post pandemic, because that's the hope with these extra funds. These are above and beyond. So I, I really hope because as it is, as you know, I think in the past 76% of our students access counseling and these days it feels like 99.9% .9 need to access, including staff, right? So it's just a hope that though these funds may seem minimal, they'll get us over that hump, uh, hopefully. And, and I think that that also reflects well to the comment we've heard uh, a few times tonight that this work that we're undertaking now needs to be overwhelmingly student facing mm -hmm. and immediately impactful. Mm -hmm. other board questions, comments? I, I wanted to say I appreciate the tier two. I know it's going to be hard because it's a small school. So, yeah. you know, people are like, you don't have the massive numbers that they need to feel like they're doing a lot of work. But I'll, I'll send you two names of people. Please, thank you. Um, who have um, private practices. Oh, um, okay. That maybe that is the way to go. Sometimes the larger companies. Yeah. Um, they're still recruiting. Sometimes if we yeah. do smaller yeah. practices, sometimes that one person will be like, oh, okay, I'll come out for three or four kids. Yes, yes. Um, so I'll send you some names for that. Um, I am interested in what you're saying around kids who are students, excuse me, who are um, be missing school because of COVID. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not for sure, um, Dr. Williams, how we keep those numbers. It may be a small number, but it still may be very impactful to kind of think about, not just for this grant, but in general, how do we serve those young people um, who are not school? 
They are tracked by our wonderful nurses aides who are amazing. Jackie Furious is my angel. And so what happens anytime we, we know that of some sort of exposure, we fill out this spreadsheet, she goes into conversation. So it is in one place where you could see how many students are effective and it, and it shows their allowed return date. You can see very quickly uh, from that document how many students have been affected. And then, as I mentioned, it's 6% more than usual for us, which you feel in such a small school, you feel it. And it's just having them back in your classroom after such a long time is, you know, when a kid is absent, that you, you have all the systems in the world, you know what to do, you've been absent, take care of this, but it's not enough when you add the layer of anxiety and feeling, are they looking at me because I've been gone for a week? Do they know that I was sick? You know, it's just, there's so many more layers these days. All right. okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank and, you. I'll be uh, back for the approval. We'll before. <laughs> before the end of the sentence. Okay, well, due to our uh, agenda juggling, um, that concludes all our agendized items. We can move on to uh, 16, the Board of Trustees and Superintendents comments, committee reports, and agenda setting. Eric. Um, yeah, a couple of things. <clears throat> um, wanted to thank uh, Trustee Stevenson who came out to the teddy bear tea that was organized by um, Redwood City Together. It was a wonderful event. Uh, we had families from North Fair Oaks and other neighborhoods in Redwood City building teddy bears together for United Against Hate Week. It was really a sweet thing and something close to my heart because I really believe we need to build a community before kids get to high school. <laughs> I've been saying that for as long as I've been on this board. And that's just a small step, but uh, I really hope that at some point we can do a lot more with our rising eighth graders because I think in a way it's too late for some kids once they land on the campus and it has to be in a social emotional fun way and this little pilot really worked I mean it was just it was just magical so thank you um Shawnees for attend for attending it meant a lot to have you there um Alan and I both attended this stu student uh climate action committee it was really really good it was really eye-opening as I was thinking about you know the requests we have for funding I was wondering if we should agendize. I mean, I learned a lot about recycling. I mean, I think there's some small things we could do and we really need to model as a district. So I would love to request um, a discussion um, with Ms. Leach about, you know, is there anything more we can do for recycling? And, and that could be a budget item. And then these are some teachers who are so knowledgeable in our district about the single use plastic issue and uh, one teacher thinks there are just some things that would not really cost that much that would make a huge, uh, huge difference. So I found it uh, a, a fantastic meeting. And of course it's organized by our students. So completely amazing. Um, I think I want everything. Remember now. Um, there's probably other numbers I can't remember, but that's it for now. Hi. Hello. Hello. I just have a couple of things. So this is more of an update and then I have agenda items, but I can wait if there's another time to say agenda item. I'm going to the Dream Club Center on Friday um, from Sequoia. Um, I want I read something, I'm getting emails. Oh, it's not on. Oh, it's not. You can't hear me. Okay, now you. Oh, okay. Can y'all hear me now? Okay. Um, but Carmont, I, my heart pattered because Carmont is going to the DECA conference, um, Distributed Education Clubs of America. I was a DECA student, so love to hear more about what they're doing there. Um, I thought that was pretty cool. Um. I wanted to let you all know that um, the San Mateo Chamber of Commerce is doing a leadership program and I'll be speaking on a panel calling, called, called Changing Landscape in Education. I'm sorry, I'm getting tired, y'all. Um, and then also 
let you all know that I met with Bonnie. Uh, we had a quick 30 minute meeting around person-centered language. And we thought about uh, what trustee Jen was like, what are the terms that we already use now? And how do we want to flip our language to be more strength-based, human-centered, non-stigmatizing, those kinds of things. So we came up with a few lists, particularly around the mo how we talk about students and specifically around um, certain terms that the federal government uses for the grant purposes, which we'll always use but how do we wanna talk about it in our meetings and videos, all these kinds of things. And so Bonnie, I, I came up with some things that we talked about. She's gonna come back to you. Um, and we have to figure out how to go through the different um, levels of leadership, like the student advisory group or the parents um, advisory group, the principals, whatever. Cause I do think people need to have input and I'm not talking about an exhaustive list only the stuff we talk about here because it can go on forever. But how are we talk about um, our students who need support in different ways, um, students of color, students with different abilities. Um, and so just kind of thinking about that. So that's coming. So just wanted to make sure you all knew that. Um, and I think that's all that I have right now, but I do have um, a couple of agenda items that I, I want to talk about. Shawnice, did you mention the drink club dinner? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That's, that's yeah. the thing I forgot. I'm so excited for the burritos and the students' speeches. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so do I do the agenda items now? Okay. Um, President Sarver, you had spoke, and maybe I'm misinterpreting. I know we're going to get the governance calendar soon. Um, you had mentioned something that really perked my interest given kind of what we've been hearing from the community, why I know as a parent, as well as working at my own school is around how do we care for our, our schools, how do we humanize our teachers, our students, and how do we support them and their wellness, but also many people who are support staff in other ways, whether administration, how can we have a real conversation around that? I don't know if it will end up in a budget. I don't, you know, because I know things are we didn't plan for this, um, but I thought that you wanted to talk about that. And I was just wondering when that is gonna be on the agenda. So I wanted to put that back around. And then the other one, I think I read this or maybe it was in my dream. Y'all tell me which one it was, um, but I wanted to talk, bring up again, the board evaluation, not superintendent evaluation, but how can we do a board evaluation to kind of figure out um, how we're functioning now and how can we be better um, for the sake of our superintendent, our, our students and everyone, everybody's getting an evaluation but us. And so I, I think it's time for us to think about a formal process. And we love, I don't know how it gets on the agenda, maybe we take a vote, but I'd like those two things to be considered. Okay, so so let's go through both. Uh, the, the first, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, staff, Staff and student wellness. Um, I know, Dr. Williams, you were planning on bringing uh, some things to us. Okay. Um, the okay. next meeting. Okay. So that that's that's great. I think that's already on the way. Uh, and uh, we we have touched on um, the importance of uh, structured board self evaluation. I um, I would. Well, I would like to check. Do we have a majority of the board at least that would like to have that be a discussion? Okay, so that is unanimous interest in that. So let's try and add that to an upcoming uh, agenda soon. Can I add a procedural question. Uh, it's my understanding that we were going to put together a governance calendar, and I was hoping it would have the series of topics we're interested in. My concern is that when any board member raises a possible topic here, I assume it's going to be, it'll have great merit. The issue for us, I think, will be in prioritizing yeah. them. Yeah. And so looking at the group of them, I think, is going to be important rather than taking serial votes on each that, that will tend to support talking about it. And we run out of time, I, I think, or we don't devote enough time. I hear some of my colleagues speak to that don't devote enough time to any particular subject. I think I've been thinking a lot about this, you know, cause we do, there are things that come up during the year 
And I think if we're so rigid, then we do miss things. And it's this idea that there's the big things, but sometimes there's the small tweaks and we can't respond to everything. But I think there does need to be an opportunity you know, like with the students working on this, there needs to be an opportunity for some things sometimes. And maybe that's more of a board discussion um, because I do feel we miss a lot as a, as a board. So I think, you said something you were, I think you two are consistent with each other. Absolutely. You're suggesting that there'd be a list and that we would look at it and prioritize. Yep. And so the prioritization, something might move up or down with time because of need. Well, I mean, I don't think you that's, were saying different things. I, I agree. I assume that it's, there's going to be a rolling nature to that. It won't be settling on at any one point on what that list is going to be. So, so we, we, we have intermittently had um, a version of the governance calendar attached actually to this agenda item on the board. But th this week it um, says TBD. Uh, Dr. Williams, I, I believe you're you're getting ready also to to present that to the board as as an item. Okay, so well, it will be. Um, yes, we are presenting uh, the updated version along with the list of requested items, and so we do track your requests, and we also uh, track when we meet those requests as well. And so it will be helpful uh, for you all when we present it, so then you have discussion about priority. We track we we track everyone's yes requests. Other. I do, I do have a question. Do we um because the issues that Trustee Sitz did have brought up, do those get agendized or are those just parent um student comments or how does that work? How do students get things on the agenda? So we do track those topics as well, and so they will be part of the governance calendar review, and then you all will have those topics among others to so prioritize. Vote on their topics that they want to get on the agenda. I guess I'm trying to for, for processing. Process. So vote on their, it's the same process. So if, it the yes, time. it is. Okay. I'm, where's your need for clarity? Because- um, so Let me just give an example. Okay. It might be easier. Trustee did talk about the bathrooms twice, mm -hmm. right? And then she talked about um, the consent training. So she just made a public a comment as part of her reporting, but I don't, I haven't seen from last, from the last trustee to this student trustee that they actually asked to put something on the agenda, right? It's just comments. And so how do they get things on the agenda? So they are part of the governance team. And I don't know, Alan, if you want to answer it, but I can answer it as well. Oh, sorry, it's, it's, I wasn't challenging. I was just trying to figure out the process. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what, what Dr. Williams is talking about is that that part of the governance calendar includes on it a list of um, suggested agenda items and that our review of it should include looking at that list of su suggested items, trying to prioritize them within the board and saying, we need to get this one on here soon. And then to be looking at the overall governance calendar and say, oh, this is already a killer meeting. It's, it's not a good candidate for shoving something in. Oh, here's a snooze fest. You know, we're either gonna go, we're, we're either gonna go home at, at seven o'clock with, with nothing to do, or we're gonna add some good meat to it. Uh, although I haven't attended that meeting yet. Okay. so. Let me clarify. So is the consent, <laughs> Alan, <laughs> you, I love you. Um, let me get my thoughts together. Tony, so I have a question that might help here. Thank you, help me. <laughs> I understand our practice to be needs two board members to do something that doesn't require staff work and three to do something that does. Mm -hmm. So if the student trustee raises something, how do they get the second or third vote that they need? In, your, in what you were just saying. I'm just trying, Alan, I'm asking you, this is a procedural question. Okay. Our practice is, I understand it, two, if it doesn't require staff work, three, if it does. And we need like people to, to say something. Yeah. And I think that's maybe Shawnee's question. It's yeah. how does it work in this case? Like just procedurally. Okay. So we, we could certainly, we could certainly right now look across the board and say, you know, do we, do we wanna make sure that those are 
not only included in well, the I, list, but so maybe yet yes to addressing those specific things, but broadly, yeah. how is it supposed to work? It, it, or how do you view in your in your view? Is it that we should, whenever a student trustee, see if there's other votes for it? Is that should that be our practice, in your opinion? Yes, I think that makes sense. I think you know having. Yeah, I, I think at this moment we can take those two suggestions as basically having having been effectively made during agenda setting, and we could we could deal with it now. <laughs> uh, but what Dr. Williams was just talking about is preparing the governance calendar for a review, including the list of things that have been suggested um, to to look at them again. I think I think as things have been raised by. Um, the elected board members, we have been pretty consistently making sure that we had the two or three person support. And those things have been going on the list as already supported. Um, so the, the ones that our student trustees have raised are kind of on, on the list, um, but we haven't gone through that process yet. I think we were just talking about going back through the entire list balancing it against the governance calendar and saying where and when do we think we can fit those in um so may i um raise a question or make a suggestion and it's not to duck a vote on toilets but instead to observe that some of the some of the things we may hear including the student comments are policy and discussion related but there are other issues that I think of as being operational, and particularly the the way I heard the issue about toilets being urgent, but is kind of an operational thing, where I would not expect us to agendize a discussion on that. But instead, I think my general observation is I wait for the Friday newsletter from the superintendent, and if it's not, and expect it's probably going to be addressed there. And if it's not addressed there, then I, as an individual board member, will either bring it back to us, if I'm concerned, um, and I would be, I'd bring it back to us, raise it with you, raise it with the superintendent, something like that. So that we focus on appropriate discussion questions that should come before the board. And probably the, the, the language issue sounds like a discussion item to me. I'm sorry, consent education. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. I'll agree with Chris. I don't know that we need to have an agenda items about our facilities being inappropriate for our students because things are locked. I mean, I think that's made more a, a board update as opposed to dealing with. I don't think anyone's going to disagree that we want the kids to be able to eat and go to the bathroom. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we don't need an agenda item on that necessarily. But the um, training could that be a and that one well that does me, seem like i don't know if that's something that requires board action or doesn't i, I don't know but i the reason why i'm asking because i'm actually very confused that that we haven't i'm learning more through dr williams and all you all that we need to vote on topics so i keep hearing um a couple of topics keep coming up and i'm just wondering instead of it being a public comment every meeting how do we get things on the agenda or do we say oh thank you trust student trustees we're taking care of it like this and we'll get back to you like this or can we get this on just say it will be on the agenda we'll figure out how to get it agendized but at least vote on it i think our student trustee has a comment maybe do i have to like officially say i want to put this item on the agenda I, I think we've indicated that we we've heard you and <laughs> we're talking about how to how to make sure that that goes through the channels. But I would think it'd be appropriate for the student trustees at the future agenda items if there were items yeah. that you want to have on the agenda that you felt would be agenda items to bring them up at this section of the meeting, which is for future agenda yeah. items. And just so you know, our some of our past student trustees they haven't asked for agenda items very often. I can only think of maybe one other time. So this is why we probably don't have a very good process. So can we take a vote on that topic? <laughs> I just wanted to make sure it gets on the agenda. I just wanted to support trust, student trustees um, said to get in trustee of SUNA to make sure that that particular item is on the agenda. Can, can we ask the superintendent first, whether that's something you think happens administratively by the superintendent or is appropriate to board discussion? 
I do think that it happens um, administratively. I also see the value of having students come forth and presenting a presentation around their thinking and actually their desires um, within consent language. So I think it will be a, an appropriate information item um, in listening to student voices and then having our response as a district from an administrator perspective. And we're saying yes to the consent agenda just for the minutes. Oh, the, cons the consent, consent language, right? The consent language. Okay. Clarify. Are we? Are you requesting this for the next or for a topic to um, be added to the list of topics? I think added to the list of topics, but I would say this is probably, I mean, at least for your female students one of the most pressing issues. So I would kind of star it. I can respect that. And so uh, we will work with uh, Dr. Chacon as we prepare our uh, social emotional uh, presentation for December. I believe that we could align that presentation with your request, uh, if that is the desire of the board. Yeah. I think we're looking to you for guidance on it. Okay. Uh, all right. And uh, I have uh, a couple of uh, committees that I've been attending that I wanted to talk. I was, uh, as uh, Carrie mentioned, I was with her in the sustainability committee. And uh, so that has students, the students who have presented to us um, about things like um, solar paneling and um, and uh, recycling and, and those things. Um, and they're very eager to be actively supportive and uh, encouraging uh, greater action by the district. Um, in the breakout session I attended, we identified at least a couple of ways um, that they can have a large impact. Um, you know, one is around transportation to and from school and really being active ambassadors for riding Samtrans and trying to um, reduce the number of low occupancy vehicles coming to and from the campuses, um, more bike riding, more walking, more rolling to school, um, and trying to really uh, help build momentum for that on the campuses. Um, and uh, uh, the other is uh, there was a lot of interest expressed in um, the sustainability of district facilities. And we talked about the fact that we have a strong intention to be engaging student voice in our facilities planning cycle leading to the next bond. And I, uh, uh, Crystal, I, I believe you've been in touch pretty actively with some of the, the members of that sustainability committee already but I did remind them to please contact you both about uh, being sure they, they are able to participate in the facilities planning and also whether um, there is uh, there's somebody in your department that would be appropriate to be attending uh, ongoing sustainability meetings. And I think Katinka is the, the organizing leader of the group. Excellent. Excellent, thank you. Um, and and the the other um, committee I've been attending regularly is also actually uh, in your real house as well, which is the uh, the Redwood City Together Safe Routes to School Committee. Um, and they have been um, Sean has been a very active participant in those, uh, uh, and they've been very actively looking at the actual safety around this area in particular. Um, access to Sequoia High School, access to uh, McKinley MIT, um, and access to uh, the, the large private school around the corner. Um, 
both um, walking safety and also SAM trans uh, service to the area. Um, and so there's a lot of ongoing work um, to try and make sure that SAM trans in their uh, route uh, reworking actually um, brings a route down James Avenue and, and really delivers a lot of students right to this area. Um, but uh, an important uh, breakthrough that was just announced is that SAMTRANS has apparently committed to piloting sometime during second semester um, provision of some additional number of uh, uh, paid bus passes uh, to students qualifying for free and reduced lunch. What we don't know yet is the actual timing and the actual scope of what that is. Um, but it's going to be very important for the district to be uh, as plugged in as possible and working strongly with Sam Trans on that and making sure that um, we're able to ab absolutely um, bring that to as many students as we possibly can. Um, and uh, that's that's an area that we'll uh, we'll also ask that sustainability group to lend their voices to. Um, so those are the the two um, activities we've had going on. Um, if I may, I just wanted to uh, clarify. Uh, I know that uh, Trustee Dubois. Uh, mentioned the recycling as a topic and i just want to make sure and clarify that there was uh, board support around that topic so can you clarify what it is that you want is it a, is it something in the update or is you looking for someone to present to us or i think i'd like to hear from crystal because i think she's talked to the student trustees and you know how much are we recycling you know and, and what i've heard is that it it, it, it um it gets contaminated because of the single-use plastic so it's really hard um i know when i first came to this district at one school we weren't re recycling at all and i was kind of shocked and i think students started to drive this and there's also some new legislation that schools are required to do more composting um and i mean maybe we could even do like a board tagline with theme just to try just with even our own work with our own meetings to try to do zero waste and, and better recycling just so we can model it so i think i would like to have a board discussion on what we can do in a small way um model from the top and then also hear from crystal let, let you me, might have better ideas you were in the well, same well let, let me make a, a suggestion it, it it seems to me that as we get that facilities task force actively going. I think one of the, the many things that it will be looking at in a very large scale is sustainability issues and sustainability efforts in the district. Um, and that's gonna play in heavily to the prioritization of where we're looking to be spending large amounts of money. And I think a sustainability audit might be a, a, a relatively early outcome of that facilities task force that could be reported back to the board. Um, and, you know, Crystal, you, you can give me some feedback if that seems to be kind of way off on a tangent from what, what you're envisioning as important steps. I wonder if I could state a preference a little differently. And certainly I believe in recycling and do it, and I've already done it here tonight. Um, but, but for me, the issue of recycling is something that I think you could get to us 
in information and, and may not deserve full discussion as opposed to the sustainability issue, which I think Alan was speaking to, which, which is a big important issue and will have multiple impacts. It, it can affect the budget in major ways. I think it tells a bigger picture to students and, and can engage students in a bit bigger picture about the way we think about global climate change. And so the board discussion that I would advocate for is one around sustainability. And do our policies at the district support sustainability? Should, should the district as a government agency lead on the issues of sustainability or should we follow? If we lead, there's a, probably a cost to that. I think that's come up in the buses, buses. So I see a whole series of things that would be important to discuss. And, and so I'd rather see that agendized rather than just the solitary issue of recycling. And add one thing to my comment, which is a reflection on the fact that my city, my hometown, Menlo Park, for example, is engaging in the conversation about whether we should move to all electric facilities, right? That's a much bigger thing. In, that's homes and businesses eliminating gas, as an example, which would have big impacts. And it's something the district could do conceivably but you'd want to have a board conversation and probably a community conversation about that. That's my one opinion. And, and Chris, I believe your, your statement of that was in, in line very much with, with what, I, what, I, what I wanted to do, I think. So we want to have that big conversation and we want to have it when, when, it's, when it's the right time for staff. Traditions, and if not, um, I will entertain a motion for uh, adjournment. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second that motion. Okay, all in favor. All right. Thank you. Good evening. Look at that. We didn't even have to ask to extend the meeting.